Those of you who have come from out of state, welcome to Omaha. The city is delighted to have you here for this event. And for those of you who came from outside of the country, welcome to the United States. So we've got people here from all over the world. We've got some overflow rooms that uh, are taking care of people. And we will just have a few preliminaries, and then we will move right into the uh, Q&A period. We'll break about noon uh, for about an hour. We'll come back and uh, do more Q&A until about 3.30, then we'll adjourn for a few minutes, and then they will con we'll conduct the uh, meeting. Uh, I understand that in the room adjacent that Charlie has been conducting a little insurgency campaign. I don't know whether you've seen these, but these are the buttons that are available for those of you who uh, you keep asking questions about succession, and Charlie wants to answer that question uh, by getting your vote today. So it says, uh, this one says, maturity, experience, why accept second best? Vote for Charlie. At, uh, <laughs> I, however, have appointed the monitors who have collected the votes, so I feel very secure. <laughs> the, the first thing I'd like to do uh, Charlie is my partner of 60 years, director and vice chairman, and we make uh, the big decisions jointly. It's just that we haven't had any big decisions, so, so uh, we haven't. We've, uh, we're keeping him uh, available for the next big one. But, uh, now, at the, for at the formal meeting today, we'll, we'll elect uh, 14 directors, and you're looking at two of them. And I'd like to introduce the uh, 12 that will be uh, uh, on the ballot uh, at 345. And I'm going to proceed uh, alphabetically. And if they'll stand, if you'll withhold your applause, because some of them get sensitive if certain people get more applause than others. And, <laughs> so, and if you withhold it till I'm finished, uh, then you can applaud or not, as you see fit, having looked at these directors. Uh, so we'll start on my left, uh, uh, Greg Abel, who's both a vice chairman and a director. Greg, uh, yeah. Oh, there we are. Right. Okay. And going along uh, alphabetically, uh, Howard Buffett, Steve Burke, Sue Decker, Bill Gates. Sandy Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, Ajit Jain, who is also a vice chairman, Tom Murphy, Ron Olson, Walter Scott, and Merrill Whitmer. Now you can applaud. <laughs> now, this morning, uh, we posted on our website the uh, quarterly of uh, the 10Q that's uh, required to be filed with the um, SEC. We published it at 7 o'clock uh, Central Time. And we also published an accompanying press release. And if we'll put slide one up, these figures, uh, as usual, require some explanation. As, as we've mentioned in the annual report, the new gap rules, generally accepted accounting principles, require that we mark our securities to market, and then report any unrealized gains in our earnings. And you can see, I've warned you about the distortions from this sort of thing. And, you know, the first quarter of 2019 actually was much like the first quarter of 2018. And I hope very much that newspapers do not read headlines saying that we made $21.6 billion in the first quarter of this year against the loss of last year. These, the bottom line figures are going to be totally capricious. And what I worry about is that not everybody studied accounting in school, or they can be very smart people, but that doesn't mean that they've spent any real time on accounting. And I really regard these bottom line figures, particularly if they're emphasized in, in the press, uh, as doing as potentially being harmful to our shareholders and really not being helpful. So I, I, I encourage you now, and I encourage all the press that's here, 
uh, focus on what we call our operating earnings, which were up a bit, and forget about the capital gains or losses in any given period. Now, they're enormously important over time. Uh, uh, we've had substantial capital gains in the future. We have substantial unrealized capital gains at the present time. We expect to have more capital gains in the future. They're, they are an important part of Berkshire, but they have absolutely no predictive value or analytical value in the, uh, on a quarterly basis or an annual basis. And uh, uh, I just hope that nobody gets misled in some quarter when stocks are down and people that Berkshire loses money or something of the sort. It's, it's, really, it's really a shame that the rules got changed in that way, but we will report. But we will also explain, and we will do our best uh, to have the press uh, understand the importance of focusing on operating earnings and that we do not attract shareholders who think that there's some enormous gain because in the first quarter the stock market was up. And there's one other footnote to these figures that I should point out. It's already been picked up by the wires uh, from our 7 o'clock filing. We report on Kraft Heinz, of which we own about 27 percent or so. We report on what they call the equity method. Now, most stocks, when you get dividends, that goes into our earnings account, and their undistributed earnings don't affect us. They affect us in, in a real way, but they don't affect us in an accounting way. We are part of a control group at Kraft Heinz, so instead of reporting dividends, we report what they call equity earnings. Uh, Kraft Heinz has not fi filed their uh, 10K for the 2018 year with the SEC, and therefore they have not uh, released the first quarter of 2019 earnings. Now, normally, we would include our percentage share of those earnings, and we've done that every quarter up till this quarter. But because we do not have those figures, we've, we've just uh, — we've not included anything. We received uh, 40 cents times $130 million of dividends in the first quarter from our shares, but that reduces our carrying basis, and it, it is not reflected in the earnings. So uh, that's an unusual item which we have mentioned, specifically pointed out in our press release as well as included in our own. But there is nothing in here, uh, plus or minus, for Kraft earnings, Kraft Heinz earnings this year, whereas there was last year. When we have the figures, obviously, uh, we will report them. Let's see what beyond that I want to tell you. Oh, yes, I wanted to mention to you, uh, the Keywood Company, which has been a uh, landlord uh, since 1962, 57 years, uh, uh, has owned the building in which Berkshire uh, is headquartered. Keywood Company is uh, uh, moving their headquarters and in the process will be doing something with the building. And they very, very generously, as they always have been, uh, they came and said, what kind of a lease would you like since we're leaving and we've always sort of work these things out as we've gone along. And uh, uh, so Bruce Grubcock, who uh, runs Kiewit, uh said, you just sort of, you name your terms and what you'd like, uh, so you, you uh, no, no matter what happens with the building, you're all set. So I was about to uh, sign a 10-year lease for the present space, but Charlie said, uh, 10 years might be long enough for me, but he said he would like me to sign one for 20 years, considering it. And uh, so we, we are entering a 20-year lease, and uh, I confess to you that we now occupy one full floor, uh, as we have for decades. And uh, the new lease provides for two floors, so I just want you to know that uh, your management is loosening up just a little bit. Uh, and whether or not we fill them is another question, but uh, we will have that. And, and I would like to say to Omaha that uh, I think the fact that Berkshire has signed up for 20 years is, 
very good news for the city <laughs> over time. It, uh... Now I would like to uh, tell you something about the people that make all of this possible. This is totally a, this is a homegrown operation. We started with a few people meeting in the lunchroom at National Indemnity many years ago. And I think we will probably set another record for attendance today. Yesterday afternoon, uh, 16,200 people uh, came in five hours, and that broke the previous record by a couple thousand. On Tuesday, the Nebraska Furniture Mart did $9.3 million worth of business. And if any of you are in the retail business, you'll know that that's a yearly volume for some furniture stores. And uh, here in Omaha, the 50th or so largest market in the country, maybe even a little less, uh, $9.3 billion, I think, probably exceeds anything any home furnishing store has ever done in one day. And we have people pitching, and we have we have all of the people, virtually all of the people from the home office, some, some of them, uh, uh, you know, they'll take on any task. We have a bunch of people from National Indemnity, for example, that come over, and they've been some of the monitors around. But, and in terms of the exhibit hall, more than 600 people from our various subsidiaries give up a, a weekend, come to Omaha, work very hard, and tomorrow, 4 or 4.30, they, they are, I should say today at 4 or 4.30, they will start packing up things and heading back home, and they, they, they come in, and I, I saw them all yesterday, and they were a bunch of very, very happy, smiling faces, and they don't, you know, they, they, they work hard all year, and then they come in and, and help us out on this meeting. And then, finally, uh, if we could get a spotlight, I think Melissa Shapiro is someplace here. She runs the whole show. I mean, we, did we, Melissa, where are you? Uh, uh, Melissa's name was Melissa Shapiro before she got married. Then she married a guy named Shapiro, so now she's Melissa Shapiro Shapiro. So that, uh, uh, but she can handle that sort of thing. She handles everything. And, and uh, never totally unflappable, totally organized. Everything gets done. Everybody likes her when they get through. So I, it, it's, it's marvelous to uh, get a chance to work with people like this. It's, it's, it, I think it's, 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 uh, it's a special quality that at, uh, at Berkshire, uh, I think other people would hire some group to put on the meeting and all be very professional and all of that. But I don't think you can get I don't think you can buy the enthusiasm and energy and, and help the next guy uh, feeling that you've seen out on that uh, exhibition floor. And you'll see as, as you meet people here at the hall and, and as you meet the people around Omaha, they're very, very happy that you're here. And with that, I would like to start on the questions, we'll do it just as we've done it in recent years. We'll, we'll uh, uh, start with the press group. They've received uh, emails from a great many people, perhaps they can tell you how many, and uh, selected the questions they think would be most useful to the Berkshire shareholders. Uh, Yahoo is webcasting this. That they've done for several years now. They've done a terrific job for us. So this uh, meeting is going out both in English and in, in Mandarin. Uh, and uh, I hope our results translate well, uh, or our, 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 uh, our comments translate well. Uh, sometimes we have trouble with English. Um, uh, but we're going to we'll start in with Carol Loomis, my friend of 50 years, but you'll never know it by the question she's going to ask me. <laughs> In the third quarter of last year, you spent almost $1 billion buying Berkshire B stock at an average price of $207. But then you got to a period between, 19, between December 26th and April 11th when the stock languished for almost four months under 207 
and yet you purchased what I think of as a very limited amount of stock. Even as you were sitting on an enormous pile of $112 billion. My question is why you did not repurchase a lot more stock, unless, of course, there was for a time an acquisition of, say, $80 billion to $90 billion on your radar. Yeah, the question, uh, whether we had $100 billion or $200 billion uh, would not make a difference, or $50 billion would not make a difference in our approach to repurchase of shares. We, we repurchase shares. We formula, form, we used to have a, a, a policy of tying it to book value, that, but that became, uh, really became obsolete. It, it did not, the real thing is to buy stock, repurchase shares, only when you think you're doing it uh, in a, at a price where the uh, remaining shareholders have had, are, are worth more of the moment after you repurchased it than they were the moment before. It's very much like if you were running a partnership and you had three partners in it and the business was worth three million and uh, one of the partners came and said, I'd like you to buy back my share of the partnership for a billion. Um, I started out with millions, I'll stay with millions, <laughs> for 1.1 million and we'd say, forget it. And if he said, one million, we'd probably uh, uh, say forget it. Unless, and uh, if he said, if he said nine hundred thousand, we'd take it because at that point, uh, the remaining business would be worth two million one, and we'd have two owners, and our interest in value would have gone from a million to a million and fifty thousand. So, it's it's very simple arithmetic. Most companies adopt repurchase programs, and they just say we're going to spend so much. Uh, that's like saying we're going you know, to we're gonna buy XYZ stock and we're going to spend so much, or we're going to buy a company and we're going we're gonna to spend whatever it takes. Uh, we will buy stock when we think it is selling below a conservative estimate of its intrinsic value. Now, the intrinsic value is not a specific point. It's probably a range in my mind uh, that might have a band maybe of 10%. Uh, uh, Charlie would have a band in his mind, and it would probably be 10 percent. And ours would not be identical, but they'd be very close. And sometimes he might <coughs> figure a, a bit higher than I do, a, a bit lower. But we want to be sure when we repurchase shares that those people who have not sold shares are better off than they were before we repurchased them. It's very simple. and. In the first quarter of the year, they'll find we bought something over a billion dollars worth of stock. And that's nothing like my ambitions, but it, what that means is that we, we feel that we're okay buying it, but we don't salivate over buying it. We think that the shares we repurchased in the first quarter leave the shareholders better off than if we hadn't, the remaining shareholders better off than if we hadn't bought it. But we don't think the difference is dramatic. And you will, you could easily see periods where we would spend very substantial sums uh, if we thought the stock was selling at, say, 25 or 30 percent less than it was worth, and we didn't have something else that was even better. Uh, but we have no ambition <coughs> in any given quarter to spend a dime unless we think you're going to be better off uh, for us having done so. Charlie? Well, I, I predict that we'll get a little more liberal in repurchasing shares. I was going to give you equal time, but then... <laughs> Do you and current BNSF management believe that it's now a good idea for BNSF to adopt Precision Railroading Playbook, or do you agree with its critics? Precision Railroading is its... This is labeled, was uh, uh, probably invented by a fellow named Hunter Harrison. Uh, I think maybe he was at the Illinois Central Railroad uh, at the time. There's a, there's a book that came out about Hunter who died uh, maybe a year ago or thereabouts. Uh, and it, it describes the, his uh, procedure toward railroading. It's, it's an interesting read if you're, if you're interested in railroading. And uh, he took that 
to uh, Canadian National, CN. There are six big railroads uh, in North America, and he took that to CN, and he was very successful. And actually, Bill Gates is probably the largest holder of CN, so it, uh, and he's, I think he's done very well with that stock. Uh, and then uh, later, Canadian Pacific was the uh, subject of an activist, and when they, as they proceeded, they uh, got Hunter to join them and brought in an associate, uh, Keith Rio, who, who uh, and they instituted a somewhat similar program. Now the same thing has happened at CSX, and all of those companies dramatically improved their profit margins, and they had varying degrees of difficulty uh, with customer service and the implementing of it, but uh, I would say that we watch very carefully. The Union Pacific is doing a somewhat modified version, uh, but the uh, we are not we are not uh, 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 above copying anything that is successful. And I think that there's been a good deal good deal uh, that's been learned by watching these four railroads and. Uh, we will, if, if we think we can serve our customers well and get more efficient in the process, uh, we will adopt whatever, uh, whatever we observe. But we don't have to do it today or tomorrow, uh, but we do have to find, we have to find something that gets at least equal and hopefully better customer satisfaction and that makes our railroad more efficient. And uh, there's been growing evidence that from the uh, actions of these other four railroads, there's been growing evidence that uh, that we can learn something from what they do. Charlie? Well, I, I doubt that anybody is very interested in unprecision in railroading. <laughs> <laughs> well, Johnny, has Charlie answered your question? <laughs> yes, thank you. Only 3.5% of the value of freight in the U.S. moves on trains. Berkshire Hathaway is incredibly well positioned with its investments in the northern and southern transcon through BNSF to grab far more of that freight traffic off of the roads and get diesel out of our communities as well as harness transmission corridors for your Berkshire renewable energy assets. We've examined a lot of things in terms of LNG. I mean, they're, they're, obviously we want to become more energy efficient as well as just generally efficient. And I'm not sure about the, the value of freight. You mentioned three and a half percent. I believe, I mean, I, I'm not sure what figure uh, you're using as the denominator there, because uh, if you look at the movement of traffic by ton miles, uh, rails are uh, around 40 percent of the U.S. We're not talking local deliveries or all kinds of things like uh, of that, but they're 40 percent uh, roughly by rail, and BNSF moves more ton miles uh, than any other entity. We move 15 percent plus of all the 10 miles moved in the United States. But if you take trucking, for example, uh, on intermodal freight, we're extremely competitive on the longer hauls, but the shorter the haul, the more likely it is that the flexibility of of freight where a truck can go any place, and we have rails. So the, the equation changes depending on distance haul and other factors, but distance haul is a, is a huge factor. We can move a ton mile, uh, 500, we can move 500 plus ton miles of freight for one gallon of diesel, and uh, that is far more efficient than trucks. So the long-haul traffic 
and the heavy tra traffic is going to go to the rails, and we try to improve our part of the equation on that all the time. But if you're going to transport something 10 or 20 or 30 miles between uh, a, sh a shipper and a, and a receiver, and they're, uh, you're not going to move that uh, by rail. So uh, we look at things all the time, I can, I can assure you. Carl Ice is in, well, he's probably here now, and he'll be in the other room, and he's running the railroad. Uh, you're free to talk to him, but I, uh, I don't see any breakthrough like you're talking about. I do see us getting more efficient year by year by year, and, and uh, obviously if, if trucks, um, driverless trucks become part of the equation, that moves things toward trucking. But on long haul heavy stuff, you know, and there's a lot of it, uh, you're looking at the railroad that, that carries more than, than, than any other mode of transportation, uh, and uh, BNSF, BNSF is the leader. Charlie? Well, over the long term, our questioner is on the side of the angels. Sooner or later, we'll have it more electrified. I think Greg will decide when it happens. Yeah. But we're all working on the technology, but, uh, uh, and we're, we're considerably more efficient than 10, 20, 30 years ago, if you look at the, at the numbers. But uh, it, one, one, indica one, one interesting figure, I think right after World War II, when the country probably had about 140 million people against our 330 million now, so we had 40 percent of the population, we had over a million and a half people employed in the railroad industry. Uh, now there's less than 200,000, and we're carrying a whole lot more freight. Now there's obviously there's some change in passengers, but the the efficiency of the railroads compared to, uh, and the safety compared to what it was even immediately after World War II, uh, has improved dramatically. Why so quiet? Yeah, I, I would say this. The <laughs> probably, well, as I see it, although, you know, I, I have been no, I've read no reports internally or anything like that, but, but it looks to me like Wells made some big mistakes in what they incentivize, and as Charlie says, there's nothing like incentives, but they can incentivize the wrong behavior, and I've seen that a lot of places, and the, the, that clearly existed at Wells. Uh, the interesting thing is, to the extent that they set up fake accounts, a couple million of them that had no balance in them that could not possibly have been profitable to, to Wells. Uh, so you can incentivize some crazy things. The, the problem is, I'm sure, is that, uh, and I don't really have any insider information on it but, at all, but, but when you find a problem, you have to do something about it. And, and uh, I think that's where they probably made a mistake at Wells Fargo. They made it at Solomon. I mean, uh, John, John Goodfriend would never have, have uh, played around with the government. He was the CEO of Solomon in 1991. He never would have done what the bond trader did that, 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 that played around with the rules that the federal government had about government bond betting. But when he heard about it, he didn't immediately notify the Federal Reserve. And he heard about it in late April, and May 15th, the government bond auction came along, and Paul Mosier did the same thing he'd done before and gamed the auction. And at this point, John Goodfriend, you know, the destiny of Solomon was straight downhill from that, stand, from that point forward, because essentially he heard about a, about a pyromaniac, and he'd let him keep the box of matches. And, and uh, uh, at Wells, my understanding, there was an article in the Los Angeles Times uh, maybe a couple of years before the whole thing uh, was exposed, and, uh, you know, somebody ignored that article, and 
Uh, Charlie has beaten me over the head all the years at Berkshire because we have 390,000 employees, and I will guarantee you that, that some of them are doing things that are wrong right now. There's no way to have a city of 390,000 people and not need, a, uh, not need a policeman or a court system. And, and uh, some people don't follow the rules, and, uh, and you can incentivize the wrong behavior. You've got to do something about it when it happens. Uh, Wells has become, uh, you know, exhibit one uh, in recent years, but it, go back a few years, you know, you, you can almost go down. There's quite a list of banks where people behave badly and, and where they, I would not say, I don't know the specifics at Wells, but I've actually written in the annual report that uh, uh, they talk about moral hazard if they they allow people to, the shareholders of, of Wells have paid a price, the shareholders of Citicorp paid a price, the shareholders of Goldman Sachs, the shareholders of Bank of America, they paid billions and billions of dollars, and they didn't commit the acts. And of course, nobody did go, there were no jail sentences, and that is infuriating. But the, the lesson is, that was taught was not that the government would bail you out, because the government, the government uh, got its money back, but the shareholders of the various banks paid many, many billions of dollars. And uh, uh, I don't have any advice for anybody running a business except when you find out something is leading to bad results or bad behavior, you know, you, if you're uh, in the top job, you've got to take action fast. And uh, that's why we have hotlines. That's why we get, when we get a not certain anonymous letters, we, we turn them over. Uh, to the audit committee or to outside uh, investigators, and uh, and we will have. I will guarantee you that we will have some people do things that are wrong at at Berkshire in the next year, five years, ten years, and fifty years. It's it, uh, you cannot have 390,000 people, and it, it's the one thing that always worries me about my job. But uh, because uh, I've got to hear about those things and I've got to do something about them uh, when I do hear about them. Charlie? Well, <clears throat> I don't think people ought to go to jail for honest errors of judgment. It's bad enough to lose your job. And I don't think that any of those top officers was deliberately malevolent in any way. I just, we're talking about honest errors in judgment. And I don't think Tim Sloan even committed honest errors of his judgment. I just think he was an accidental casualty that didn't deserve the trouble. Yeah, no, I wish this Tim, Tim Sloan was still there. Yeah, there's no evidence that he, he did a thing, but he, he stepped up to take a job that, that where he was going to be a pinata, basically, uh, uh, for all kinds of uh, investigations. And, and rightfully, Wells should be checked out on everything they do. All banks should. I mean, uh, they, get, they get a government guarantee, and they, and they receive trillions of dollars in deposits. They do that because of the, basically because of the FDIC, and, and uh, uh, if they abuse that, they should pay a price. And if anybody does anything uh, like a uh, like a Paul Mosier did, for example, of Solomon, they ought to go to jail. Paul Mosier only went to jail for four months, but but uh, if you're breaking laws, uh, you should be prosecuted on it. If you do a lot of dumb things. Uh, uh, I wish they wouldn't go away, the CEOs wouldn't go away so rich under those circumstances, but, but people will do dumb things. <laughs> I actually proposed, I think I, it may have been in one of the annual reports even, I, I proposed that if a, if a bank gets to where it needs government assistance, that uh, uh, basically the, the responsible CEO should lose his net worth and his spouse's net worth if he doesn't want the job under those circumstances. You know, uh, and I think that the directors, uh, I think they should come after the directors for the last five years, I think I proposed, of, their, of all, uh, of everything they've received. Uh, but it's the shareholders who pay. I mean, that, uh, if we own 9 percent of wells, whatever this has cost, 9 percent of it is being borne by, by us, and uh, uh, it's very hard to tie it directly. One, one thing you should know, incidentally, though, is that the FDIC, which was started, 
think it was started January 1st, 1934, but it, it was a New Deal proposal. And the FDIC uh, has not cost the United States government a penny. It now has about $100 billion in it, and that money has all been put in there by the banks, and that's covered all the losses of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of financial institutions. And uh, I think the impression is that, that the government the government guarantees save the banks, but the government money did not save the banks. The bank's money as an industry not only has paid every loss, but they've accumulated an extra $100 billion, and that's the reason the FDIC assessments now are going back down. They had them at a, at a high level, and they had a higher level for the very big banks. So it, it, uh, when, you, when you hear all the talk about, the political talk about the banks, they had not cost the federal government but, they have, they did a, there were a lot of actions that took place that should not have taken place, and there's a lot fewer now, I think, than there were in the period leading up to 2008 and 9. But uh, uh, some banks will make big mistakes in the future. Charlie? I got, I've got nothing to add to that. Oh, okay. Jay Gelb from Barclays. Barclays just had a, had a proxy contest of sorts, didn't they? That's right, boy. In a recent Financial Times article, you were quoted as saying that the time may come when the company buys back as much as $100 billion of its shares, which equates to around 20% 20, 20 of Berkshire's current market cap. How did you arrive at that $100 billion figure, and over what time frame would you expect this to occur? I probably arrived at that $100 billion figure in about three seconds when I got asked the question. <laughs> and it was a nice round figure, and we could do it. And we would like to do it if the stock was — we've got the money to, to buy in $100 billion worth of stock. At, uh, uh, and bear in mind, if we were buying in $100 billion stock, it probably would be that the company wasn't selling at $500 billion, so it might buy well over 20 percent. Uh, we will spend a lot of money. We've been involved in companies uh, where the number of shares has been reduced 70 or 80 percent over time. Uh, and uh, we, we like the idea of buying shares at a discount. We do feel if, if shareholders, if we're going to be repurchasing shares from shareholders who are partners, and we think it's cheap. Uh, we ought to be very sure that they have the facts available to evaluate what they own. I mean, just as if we had a partnership. It would not be good if there were three partners and two of them decided that they would sort of freeze out the third, maybe uh, in terms of giving them material information that they knew that that third party didn't know. So it's, it's very important that our disclosure be the same sort of disclosure that I would give to my sisters who were the imaginary — they're not imaginary, but they're the shareholders to whom I uh, address the annual report every year, because I, I do feel that you — if you're going to sell your stock, you should have the same information that's important that's available uh, uh, to me and to Charlie. But we will — if our stock gets cheap relative to intrinsic value, uh, we would not hesitate. We wouldn't be able to buy that much in a very short period of time, in all likelihood. But we would certainly be willing to spend $100 billion. Charlie? I think when it gets really obvious, we'll be very good at it. Let me get that straight. What did you say exactly? When it gets really obvious, we'll be very good at oh, it. Yeah. I was hoping that's what you said. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, we will be good at it. But we. We don't have any trouble being decisive. We, we don't do it. We don't, we don't say yes very often. But if we something something obvious, I mean, if Jay, if you and I are partners, you know, and, and our business is worth a million dollars, and you say you'll sell your half to me for three hundred thousand, you'll have your three hundred thousand very quickly. Outside of Berkshire Hathaway, what is the most interesting or fun? personal investment you have ever made? <laughs> well, 
Well, they're always, they're always more fun when you make a lot of money off of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I bought shit. One time I bought uh, one share of stock in the Atled Corp. That's spelled A-T-L-E-D. And Atled had 98 shares outstanding, and I bought one. And uh, not what you call a liquid security. Uh, and Atlid happened to be the word Delta spelled backwards. And 100 guys in St. Louis had each chipped in 50 or $100 or something to form a duck club in Louisiana. And they bought some land down there. The two guys didn't come up with their, there were 100 of them. Two of them defaulted on their obligation to come up with $100. So there were 98 shares out. And they went down to, to uh, Louisiana, and uh, uh, they shot some ducks, but apparently somebody shot, fired a few shots into the ground, and oil spurted out, and, and, uh, <laughs> and those Delta Duck Club shares, and there's, I think the Delta Duck Club field is still producing by what's stock in it 40 years ago uh, for $29,200 a share, and uh, it was, it had that amount in cash, and it was producing a lot, and they, they sold it. If, if they kept it, that stock might have been worth 2 or $3 million a share, but they sold out to another oil company. But I, that was certainly, uh, that was the most interesting thing. Actually, I didn't have any cash at the time, and uh, I went down and borrowed the money, and uh, uh, to, I, I bought it for my wife, and I borrowed the money, and, and uh, the loan officer said, would you like to borrow? some money to buy a shotgun as well. <laughs> Charlie, tell them about the one you missed. <laughs> well, I have two investments that come to mind. When I was young and poor, I spent $1,000 once buying an oil royalty that paid me 100000 a year for a great many years. But I only did that once in a lifetime. On a later occasion, I bought a few shares of Elridge Oil, which went up 30 times rather quickly. And, but I turned down five times as much as I bought. It was the dumbest decision of my whole life. So if any of you have made any dumb decisions, look up here and feel good about yourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 I could add a few, but Andrew? With all the talk about socialism versus capitalism taking place among Democratic presidential candidates, do you anticipate an impact on Berkshire in the form of more regulations, higher corporate taxes, or even calls for breakups among the many companies we own, we own if they were to win? And how do you think about your own politics as a fiduciary of our company, and at the same time as someone who has said that simply being a business leader doesn't mean you've put your citizenship in a blind trust. Yeah, I have said that, that you do not put your citizenship in a blind trust, but you also don't speak on behalf of your company. Uh, uh, you, speak, you do speak as a citizen if you speak, and therefore you have to be careful about when you do speak because it's going to be assumed you're speaking on behalf of your company. Berkshire Hathaway certainly in 54 years has, has never and will never made a contribution um, to a presidential candidate. I don't think we've made a contribution to any political candidate, but I, I don't want to say for 54 years that... that uh, we don't do it now. We, have, we operate in several regulated industries, and, and our, our railroad and our utility as a practical matter. They have to have a presence in Washington or in, in the state legislatures in which they operate. So they have, we, have, we have some, a few, I don't know how many, political action committees uh, which existed when we bought it, uh, when we bought the companies at, at, at subsidiaries. And I think it, unquestionably they make some contributions uh, simply to achieve the same access as their competitors. I mean, if the trucking industry is going to lobby, I'm sure the railroad industry is going to lobby. But the general, well, the rule is, I mean, that 
people do not pursue their own political interests with your money here. We've, we've had one or two managers over the years, for example, that would, would do some fundraising where they were fundraising from people who were suppliers to them or something of the sort. And if I ever find out about it, that ends promptly. Uh, but this, my position as, at Berkshire is not to be used to further my own political beliefs, but my own political beliefs can be expressed as a person, not as a representative of Berkshire, uh, when a campaign is important. I, don't, I try to minimize it, but, I, but uh, there, it's no secret that in the last election, for example, I, I raised money. I won't give money to PACs. I, I accidentally did it one time. I didn't know it was a PAC. But uh, uh, I don't do it, but I've raised, I've raised substantial sums. I don't like the way money is used in politics. I've written op-ed pieces for the New York Times in the past on, on uh, the influence of money in politics. I, I spent some time with John McCain many years ago before McCain, McCain fine gold and uh, on ways to try to uh, limit it, but the world has developed in a different way. Uh, on your question about uh, the, the, I will just say I'm a card-carrying capitalist, um, but I, <laughs> and I, I believe we wouldn't be sitting here except for the market system and the rule of law and some things that are embodied in this country. Uh, so I, you don't have to worry about me. Uh, changing in that manner, but I also think that uh, capitalism does involve regulation. It involves taking care of people who are left behind, particularly when the country gets enormously prosperous. But beyond that, I have no Berkshire podium for pushing anything. Charlie? Well, I think we're all in favor of some kind of a government social safety net in a country as prosperous as ours. What a lot of us don't like is the vast stupidity with which parts of that social safety net are managed by the government. It'd be much better if we could do it, but it more wisely. But I, I, I think it also might be better if we did it more liberally. Yeah, one of the reasons we're involved in this effort along with J.P. Morgan and Amazon with Jamie Dimon and Jeff Bezos on the m medical question is we do have as much money going uh, 3.3 or 3.4 trillion. We have as much money going to medical care as we have funding the federal government, and and uh, that's it's gone from five to 17 percent or 18 percent, while actually the amount going to the federal government has stayed about the same at 17 percent. So uh, we hope we hope there's a uh, some major private improve ma major improvements from the private sector because I, I generally think the private sector does a better job than the public sector in most things. But uh, I also think that if the private sector doesn't do something, uh, you'll, you'll get a different sort of answer. And I like to think that the private sector can come up with a better answer than, than uh, the public sector in that respect. Uh, I will probably, it depends who's nominated, but I voted, I've voted for plenty of Republicans uh, uh, over the years. I even ran for delegate to the Republican National Convention in 1960. Uh, and, um, uh, but I don't think the country will, will go into socialism in 2020 or in 2040 or 2060. Yeah. With Berkshire having two shares of classes, you should have more flexibility when buying back stock. But given the liquidity difference that exists between the two share classes with an average of 313 Class A shares exchanging hands daily <clears throat> the past five years, equivalent to around $77 million a day, and an average of 3.7 million Class B shares doing the same, equivalent to around $622 million, Berkshire is likely to have more opportunities to buy back Class B shares than Class A, which is exactly what we saw during the back half of last year in the first quarter of 2019. While it might be more ideal for Berkshire to buy back Class A shares, allowing you to retire shares with far greater voting rights, given that there's relatively little arbitrage between the two share classes and the number of Class B shares increase every year as you gift your Class A shares to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, 
and your children's foundations, <clears throat> can we assume that you're likely to be a far greater repurchaser of Class B shares going forward, especially given your recent comments to the Financial Times about preferring to have loyal individuals on your shareholder list, which a price tag of $328,000 of Class A shares seems to engender? When we're repurchasing shares, uh, if, we, if we're purchasing substantial amounts, we're, we're going to spend a lot more on the Class B than the Class A just because the, the trading volume is considerably higher. Uh, we may, from time to time, well, we got offered a couple blocks in history, going back in history, from, from the Yoshi estate and, and, and uh, when we had a transaction exchanging uh, our Washington Post stock uh, uh, for both a television station and shares held, a shares held by the Washington Post. So we may, we may see some blocks of A, we may see some blocks of B, but, but there's no question if we, if we are able to spend 25, 50, or 100 billion dollars in repurchasing shares, more of the money is almost certainly going to be spent on the, the B uh, than the A. There's no master plan on that other than the to buy aggressively when we like the price, and, and uh, as I say, the, the trading volume in the B is just a lot higher than the A in dollar amounts. Charlie? I don't think we care much which class we buy. Yeah. We would like, we'd, we'd, we really want the stock, ideally if we could do it, if we were a small. Once a year, we'd have a price, and you know, we'd do it like a private company, and, and it would be a fair price, and people who wanted to get out could get out. And if, if other people wanted to buy their interest, fine, and if they didn't and we thought the price was fair, we'd have the company repurchase it. We can't do that. We don't want the stock to be either significantly underpriced or significantly overpriced, and we're probably unique on the overpriced part of it, but we, we don't want it. We, I do not want the stock selling at twice as what it's worth because I'm going to disappoint people. You know, I mean, uh, we can't make it. There's no magic formula to, to make a stock worth what it's selling for if it sells for way too much. Uh, from a commercial standpoint, if it's selling very cheap, we have to like it and we repurchase it. But uh, ideally, we would hope the stock would sell in a range that, uh, that uh, more or less is its intrinsic value, uh, business value. We know, have no desire to hype it in any way, and we have no desire to depress it so we can repurchase it cheap. But the, nat the nature of markets is that things get overpriced and they get underpriced, and we will, if it's underpriced, we'll take advantage of it. 5G is coming. It is said that the mode of all industry will be challenged in 5G era. What is the core competence that we should master if Bookshare Hathaway wants to catch the best investment opportunities in next era? Well, there's no core competence at the very top of Berkshire. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but we, the subsidiaries that will be involved in developments relating to 5G or any one of all kinds of things that are going to happen in this world. You know, the utility of LNG at, at, uh, in the railroad or all those kinds of questions. We have people in those businesses that uh, know a lot more about them than we do, and we count on our managers to anticipate what is coming in their business, and then sometimes they talk to us about it. Uh, uh, but uh, we do not run that from a central, on a centralized basis. And uh, um, Charlie, do you want to have anything to add to that? Do you know anything about 5G? I don't know. Well, you probably know a lot about 5G. No, I know very little about 5G. But I do know a little about China. And uh, we have bought things in China, and I, my guess is we'll buy more. Yeah. But, I mean, we basically want to have a group of managers, and we do have a group of managers, who are on top of their businesses. I mean, you saw 
something that showed BNSF and, 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 and Berkshire Hathaway Energy and Lubrizol all there. Uh, those people know their businesses. They know, what's, they know what changes are likely to be ahead. Sometimes they find things that they can cooperate on between their businesses, but we don't try to run those from headquarters. And that may have certain weaknesses at certain times. I think net is, it's been a terrific uh, benefit for Berkshire. But, uh, our managers, to a great degree, own their businesses. And, and, and they, we want them to feel a sense of ownership. We don't want them to be lost in some massive conglomerate and nobody that where they get directions from this group, which is a subgroup of that group. And I could tell you a few horror stories from uh, companies we bought when they tell us about their experience under such an operation. So we, uh, the world is going to change in dramatic ways. Just think how much it's changed in the 54 years that we've, we've had Berkshire. And some of those changes hurt us. They hurt us in textiles. They hurt us in shoes. They hurt us in department store business. Uh, hurt us in the trading stamp business. And those, these were the founding businesses of, of, of this operation. But we do adjust, and, and uh, we've got a group overall of very good businesses. We've got some that will be, will be uh, uh, actually destroyed by what happens in this world. But that's, you know, I still am the card-carrying capitalist, and I believe that, that that's a good thing. But, uh, uh, you have to make changes. We had 80 percent of the people working on farms in, in 1800. And if there hadn't been a lot of ch changes, and you needed 80 percent of the people in the country producing the food and cotton we needed, we would have a whole different society. So we welcome change, and, and we certainly want to have managers that can anticipate and adapt to it. But sometimes we'll be wrong, and, and those businesses will wither and die, and we better use the money someplace else. To what extent do the changing dynamics in the consumer food market change your view on the long-term potential for Kraft Heinz? Actually, what I said was we paid too much for Heinz. Uh, I mean, Kraft, I'm sorry. We had the, uh, the Heinz part of the transaction, when we originally owned about half of, half of uh, uh, Heinz, uh, we paid an appropriate price there. And, and we actually did well. We had some preferred redeemed and so on. Uh, we paid too much money for Kraft. To some extent, our own actions had driven up the prices. Now, Kraft Heinz, uh, the profits of that business, six billion, we'll say very, very, very um, roughly, I'm not projecting them out, uh, I'm not making forecasts, but six billion uh, pre-tax uh, on seven billion of tangible assets is a wonderful business. Uh, but you can pay too much for a wonderful business. We bought C's candy, and we made a great purchase, as it turned out, and we could have paid more. But there's some price at which we could have bought even C's candy, and it wouldn't have worked. So the business does not know how much you paid for it. I mean, it's going to, it's going to earn based on its fundamentals, and we paid, we paid too much for the craft side of Kraft Heinz. Additionally, the, the profitability has basically been improved in those operations over the way they were operating before. But you're quite correct that Amazon itself has become a brand. Kirkland at Costco is a $39 billion brand. Now, all of Kraft Heinz does $26 billion, and it's been around for, on the Heinz side, it's been around for uh, 150 years. Uh, and it's been advertised billions and billions of billions of dollars in terms of their products, and they go through tens of thousands of outlets. And here's somebody like Costco establishes a brand called Kirkland, and it's doing $39 billion more than virtually any food company. And there, that brand moves from product to product, which is terrific if a brand travels. I mean, Coca-Cola moves it from Coke to Cherry Coke and Coke Zero and so on. But to have a brand that can really move, and Kirkland does more business than Coca-Cola does. And Kirkland Act that operates through 775 or so uh, stores, they call them warehouses, at Costco, and Coca-Cola's through millions of distribution outlets. So 
brands, the retailer and the brands have always struggled as to who gets the upper hand in moving a product to the consumers. And there's no question in my mind that the position of the retailer relative to the brands, which varies enormously around the world in different countries, you've had 35 percent, even maybe 40 percent, be private label brands and soft drinks, and it's never gotten anywhere close to that in the United States. So it, it varies a lot. But basically retailers, certain retailers, the retail system has gained some power, and particularly in the case of Amazon and Walmart and their reaction to it, and Costco, and Aldi and some others I can name, gained in power relative to brands. Kraft Heinz is still doing very well operationally, but we paid too much. If we paid $50 billion, you know, it would have been a different business. It'd still be earning the same amount. You can, you can turn any, any investment into a bad deal by paying too much. What you can't do is turn any investment into a good deal by paying little, which is sort of how I started out in this world. But the idea of buying the cigar butts that, have only got, uh, that are declining or poor businesses for a bargain price is not something that, that we try to do anymore. We try to buy good businesses at a decent price, and we made a mistake on the craft part of Kraft Tynes. Charlie? Well, we, uh, it's not a tragedy that out of two transactions, one worked wonderfully and the other didn't work so well. That happens. The reduction in costs, you know, there, there can always be mistakes made when you've got places and you're rearranging, reorganizing them to do more business with them, with the same number of people. And we like buying businesses that are efficient to start with, but it's, the, the management, uh, the operations of Kraft Heinz have been improved under the, the present management overall. But uh, we paid a very high price in terms of, of the Kraft part. We didn't, we paid an appropriate price in terms of Heinz. Internet-based furniture retailers like Wayfair appear willing to stomach large current losses acquiring customers in the hope of converting them to loyal online shoppers. I've been wondering what this disruptive competition might do to our earnings from home furnishing retail operations like Nebraska Furniture Mart. If we have to transition to more of an online model, uh, might we have to spend more heavily to keep shoppers without a corresponding increase in sales? The sharp decline in first quarter earnings from home furnishings suggests perhaps some widening impact from intensifying competition. Do you believe Wayfair's customers first, profits later model is unsustainable, or do you think our furniture earnings will likely be permanently lower than they were in the past? I think furniture, the jury's still out on that, whether, whether uh, the operations, which have grown very rapidly in size, but but uh, still are incurring losses, how they will do over time. Uh, it is true that in the present market, partly because of the, some successes like most dramatically Amazon in the past, that investors are, are willing to look at losses if, as long as sales are increasing and, and hope that there will be better days ahead. We do a quite significant uh, percentage of our sales online in the furniture operation. That might surprise you. We do the, the highest percentage in Omaha. And what's interesting is that, that uh, we, we uh, I won't give you the exact numbers, but it's large. We do a significant with dollar volume, but a, a very significant portion of that volume, people come to the store to pick up so that they they will order something from us online, but they, they, they don't mind, they don't seem to mind at all, uh, and they don't have to do it, but they, they, uh, they get a pickup at the store. So, you know, it, you, you learn what customers like, just like people learned in fast food, you know, that, that people would buy a lot of food by going through a drive-in that they don't want to stop and go into the place. We learn about customer behavior as it, as it unfolds, but, we did do now, uh, on Tuesday, we did 9.2 million of, or 9.3 million of profitable volume. 
at the Nebraska Furniture Mart, and I think that company had paid in capital of $2,500, and I don't think anything's been added since. So it's working so far. The first quarter, it's interesting, the first quarter was weak at all four of our furniture operations. But there's certain other parts of the economy, uh, well, just home building generally. Uh, uh, it's considerably below what you would have expected considering the recovery we have had from the 2008-9 period. I mean, if you look at, if you look at single family home construction, uh, the model has shifted more to people living in apartment rentals. I think, it, I think it's gone from 69 and a fraction percent. It got down to 63 percent. It's bounced up a little bit. But people are, they're just not building or moving to houses as rapidly as I would have guessed they would have based on figures prior to 2008 and 9. And considering the recovery we've had and considering the fact that money is so cheap, uh, and that has some effect on our, on our furniture stores. That, uh, uh, I, I think we've got a very, a very good furniture operation, uh, not only at the Nebraska Furniture Mart, but, but at, at other furniture operations. And we will see whether the models work um, you know, over the long run. But they, I, I think you know, they have a reasonable chance. Some things people, people we, we're learning that people will buy some things that they've always gone to uh, the mall or to a retail outlet to buy that they will do it online and others don't don't work so well. Charlie? I think that we'll do better than most furniture retailers. I think that's a certainty. <laughs> yeah. uh, overall, yeah. overall. But, uh, we've got we've got some good uh, good good operations there. And um, but we don't want to become a showroom for the for the online operations and have people come and look around the place and then order someplace else. So we have to have the right prices and and uh, uh, we're good at that at the furniture market. I work on alternative alternative investments, which include infrastructure, private equity, and private credit. I go to work every day knowing that I'm there to benefit the hardworking current and future beneficiaries of the fund. Like most asset classes, alternative purchase multiples have increased. More of these assets are funded with borrow money, and the terms and covenants on this debt are essentially non-existent. With this in mind, and knowing the constraints of illiquid, closed-end funds, please give me your thoughts on private alternative investments, the relevancy in public pension funds, and your view on long-term return expectations. Yeah, if you would leveraged up investments uh, in just common stocks, and you'd figured a way so that that uh, you would have staying power if there were any market dip. I mean, you'd obviously have re obtained extraordinary returns. I pointed out in my investing lifetime, you know, an index fund would do 11 percent. Well, imagine how you'd have done if you'd leveraged that up. 50 percent, whatever the prevailing rates were over time. So a leveraged investment in a business is going to be an unleveraged investment in a good business a good bit of the time. But as you point out, the covenants to protect debt holders has really deteriorated in the business. And of course, You've been in a, an up market for businesses, and you've got a period of low interest rates. So it's been a very good time for it. I, my personal opinion is if you take the unleveraged returns against unleveraged common stocks, I do not think what is being purchased today and marketed today would work well. But if, if you can borrow money, if you can buy assets that will yield 7 or 8 percent, and you can borrow enough money at, four or five percent and you don't have any covenants to meet, you're going to have some bankruptcies, but you're going to also uh, have better results in many cases. It's not, a, 
it's not something that interests us at all. We, we are not going to leverage up Berkshire. If we'd leveraged up Berkshire, we'd have made a whole lot more money, obviously, over the years. But uh, both Charlie and I probably have seen some more high IQ people, really extraordinarily IQ people, destroyed by leverage. We saw long-term capital management where we had people who could do in their sleep math that we couldn't do, or at least I couldn't do, you know, working full-time at it during the day. And I mean, really, really smart people working with their own money and with years and years of experience of what they were doing. And, and uh, you know, it all turned to pumpkins and mice in 1998. And, and it actually was a source of national concern uh, just a few hundred people, and then we saw some of those same people after that happened to them once go out and do the same thing again. So it's, uh, I would not get excited about so-called alternative investments. There's, you can get all kinds of different figures, but there may be, there's probably at least a trillion dollars committed uh, to buying, in effect, buying businesses. And if you figure they're going to leverage them, you know, two for one on that, you may have three trillion of buying power trying to buy businesses in a, well, the U.S. market may be something over 30 trillion now, but there's all kinds of businesses that aren't for sale in that thing. So the supply-demand situation for buying businesses privately and leveraging them up has changed dramatically from what it was 10 or 20 years ago. And I'm sure it doesn't happen with your Winnipeg operation, but but we have seen a number of proposals from private equity funds where the returns are really not calculated in a, in a manner that, uh, well, I, they're not calculated in a manner that I would regard as honest. And uh, 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 so I, it, it's, 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 it's not something, I, uh, if I were running a pension fund, I would, be very careful about what was being uh, offered to me. If you have a choice in Wall Street between being a great analyst or being a great salesperson, uh, the salesperson is the way to make it. If you can, if you can raise ten billion dollars in a fund and you get a one and a half percent fee and you lock people up for ten years, you know, you and your children and your grandchildren will never have to do a thing if you are the dumbest investor in the world. But Charlie? Well, I, I think what we're doing will work more safely than what he's doing. And, but I, I wish him well. Yeah, Brent, you sound, you sound, actually, you sound like a guy that I would hope would be working for a public pension fund, because frankly, most of the most of the institutional funds, you know, the, the, well, we had this terrible uh, right here in Omaha, and uh, you, can, you can get a story of what happened with our, with our Omaha Public Schools Retirement Fund, and they were doing fine, and until uh, um, the manager started uh, going in a different direction, and the, and the trustees here, perfectly decent people. And the manager had done okay to that point, and it yeah, became— they, they were smarter in Winnipeg than they are here. Yeah, well— <laughs> That was pretty bad here. It's not a fair fight, actually, when a, usually when a bunch of public officials are listening to people who are motivated to uh, who really just get paid for raising the money. Uh, everything else is gravy after that, but, but uh, uh, you know, you, if you run a fund and— you get even one percent, you know, of of of, of a billion. You're getting ten million dollars a year coming in, and if you've got the money locked up for a long time, uh, it's it, it's a very one-sided deal. And you know, I, I told the story of asking the guy one time in the past, "How in the world can you? Uh, why in the world can you ask for?" Two and twenty, when you really haven't got any kind of uh, evidence that you uh, are going to do better with the money than you do in an index fund, and he said, "Well, that's because I can't get three and thirty. You know? 
What I don't like about a lot of the pension fund investment is I think they like it because they don't have to mark it down as much as it should be in the middle of the panics. I think that's a silly reason to buy something because you're given leniency in marking it down. Yeah, and when you commit the money, in the case of private equity often, they don't take the money, but you pay a fee on the money that you've committed. And of course, you really have to have that money to come up with at any time. And of course, it makes their return look better if you sit there for a long time in treasury bills, which you have to hold because they can call you up and demand the money, and they don't count that. They count it in terms of getting a fee on it, but they don't count it in terms of what the so-called internal rate of return is. It's, 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 uh, it's not as good as it looks, and, and I really do think that when you have a group sitting as a state pension fund— Or all they're doing is lying a little bit to make the money come in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, that, that sums it up. Yeah. Uh, with the full understanding that Warren had no input on the Amazon purchase and that relative to Berkshire, it's likely a small stake, the investment still caught me off guard. I'm wondering if I should begin to think differently about Berkshire looking out, say, 20 years. Might we be seeing a shift in investment philosophy away from value investing principles that the current management has practiced for 70 years? It's interesting that the term value investing came up, because I can assure you that both managers who, and one of them, bought some Amazon stock in the last quarter, which will get reported in another week or 10 days. He is a value investor. Uh, the idea that value is somehow connected to book value or low price earnings ratios or anything, uh, as Charlie has said, all investing is value investing. I mean, you're, you're, you're putting out some money now to get more later on, and you're making a calculation as to the probabilities of getting that money and when you'll get it and what interest rates will be in between, and all the same calculation goes into it whether you're buying some bank at 70 percent of book value or you're buying Amazon at some very high multiple of reported earnings. Amazon, the people making the decision on Amazon are absolutely much value investors as I was when I was looking around for all these things selling below working capital uh, years ago. So that has not changed. The, the two people that, one of whom made the investment in Amazon, they are looking at many hundreds of securities, and they can look at more than I can because they're managing less money and their, their universe, possible universe, is, 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 is uh, greater. But they are looking for things that they feel they understand what will be developed by that business between now and Judgment Day and cash. And, and it's, it's not it. Sales, current sales can make some difference. Current profit margins can make some difference. Tangible assets, excess cash, excess debt, all of those things go into making a calculation as to whether they should buy A versus B versus C. And they are, got, they are absolutely following value principles. They don't necessarily agree with each other or agree with me, but they are very smart. They are totally committed to Berkshire, and they're, they're, they're very good human beings on top of it. So uh, I don't, I don't uh, second-guess them on anything. Charlie doesn't second-guess me on, in 60 years, he's never second-guessed me on an investment. And uh, uh, the considerations are identical when you buy Amazon uh, versus versus uh, some, say, bank stock that uh, looks cheap statistically against book value or earnings or something of the sort. Uh, in the end, it all goes back uh, to Aesop, who in 600 BC said, you know, that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And when we buy Amazon, we try and figure out whether, or the fellow that bought it tries to figure out whether there's three or four or five in the bush. and how long it'll take to get to the bush, how certain he is that they're, he's going to get to the bush, you know, and then who else is going to come and try and take the bush away, and all of that sort of thing. And we do the same thing, and, and uh, it really, it really uh, despite, despite a lot of equations you'll learn in 
in, in business school, the basic equation is that of, of uh, ESOP, and, the, and your success in investing depends on how well you were able to figure out how certain that bush is, how far away it is, and what the worst case is, instead of two, two birds being there, only one being there, and, uh, and the possibilities of four or five or 10 or 20 being there. And uh, that, that will guide me, that will guide my successors in investment management at Berkshire, and I think they'll be right more often than they're wrong. Shortly. Well, I, I, Warren and I are a little older than some people. And yeah, near everybody. <laughs> and we're not the most flexible, probably, in the whole world. And of course, if something as extreme as this internet development happens, and you don't catch it, why other people are going to blow by you. And I don't mind not having caught Amazon early. The guy is kind of a miracle worker. It's very peculiar. I, I give myself a pass on that. But I feel like a horse's ass for not identifying Google better. I think Warren feels the same way. Yeah. We, we screwed up. He's saying we blew it. <laughs> yeah. And we did have some insights into that because we were using them at Geico and we were seeing the results produced and we saw that we were paying $10 a click or whatever it might have been for something that had a marginal cost to them of exactly zero. And, and uh, we saw it was working for us. So we, we can was, see in our own operations yeah. how well that Google advertising was working. And we just sat there sucking our thumbs. Right. So we're ashamed. We, we atone. We're trying to atone. Maybe Apple was atonement. When he says sucking her thumbs, I'm just glad he didn't use some other example. <laughs> In your most recent annual letter, you discussed a methodology to estimate Berkshire's intrinsic value. However, a major component of Berkshire's value that many investors find challenging to estimate is that of the company's vast and unique insurance business. Could you discuss how you value the company's insurance unit based on information Berkshire provides, especially since gap book value is not disclosed of the insurance unit? Well, our insurance business gives us a float that's other people's money which we're temporarily holding but which gets regenerated all the time, so it's a practical matter. It has a very, very long life, and it's probably a little more likely to grow than shrink. So we have $124 billion that people had given us, and, and that's somewhat like having a bank that just consists of one guy, and people come in and deposit $124 billion and promise not to withdraw it forever. Um, and we've got a very good insurance business. It's taken a very long time to develop it, a very long time. Uh, in fact, I think we probably have the best property casualty operation, all things considered, in the world that I know of of any size. So it's worth a lot of money. It's probably, we think it's worth more to us, and we particularly think it's worth more while lodged inside Berkshire. We'd have a very, very high value on that. Uh, uh, I, I, don't want, I don't want to give you an exact number because I don't know the exact number, but uh, and any number I would have given you in the past would have turned out to be wrong on the low side. We have managed to earn money on money that is given to us for nothing and uh, have the side earnings from underwriting and then have these large earnings from investing. And uh, it's an integral part of Berkshire. There's a certain irony to insurance that most people don't think about. but. If you really are prepared uh, and you have a diversified property casualty insurance business, a lot of property business in it, if you're really prepared to pay your claims under any circumstances that come along in the next hundred years, you have to have so much capital in the business that it's not a very good business. And if you really think about a worst case situation, the reinsurance 
That's the insurance you buy from other people as an insurance company to protect you against extreme losses, among other things. That reinsurance probably could likely be not good at all. So even though you think you're laying off part of the risk, if you really take the worst case example is you're not laying off, you may well not be laying off the risk. And if you keep the capital required to protect against that worst case example, you'll have so much capital in the business that it isn't worthwhile. Berkshire is really the ideal form for writing the business because we have this massive amount of assets that are, in many cases are largely uncorrelated with natural disasters. And we, can, we don't need to buy reinsurance from anybody else. And we can use that we can use the money in a more efficient way than most insurance companies. It's interesting, in the last 30 years, the three largest reinsurance companies, and I'm counting Lloyd's as one company, although it, it, it isn't, it, 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 it's a group of brokers assembled and uh, or, uh, underwriters assembled at a given location. But people think of Lloyd's as as a massive reinsurance market, which it is, not technically one entity. Uh, but if you take the three largest companies, and they're all in fine shape now, I, I, they're, they're first class operations, but all three of them came close to extinction sometime in the last uh, 30 years, reasonably close. Uh, and we didn't really have any truly extraordinary natural catastrophes. The worst we had was Katrina, in, uh, whatever it was, 2006 or thereabouts, 2005. Uh, but we didn't have any worst case situation. And all three of those companies, which everybody looks at as totally good on the asset side, if you show a, a recoverable from them, uh, two, of the, two of the three actually made some deals with us to, to help them in some way. Uh, and they're all in fine shape now. But it's not a, it's really not a good business if you keep your for as a standalone insurer if you keep enough capital to really be sure you can pay anything that comes along under any kind of conditions and Berkshire can do that and it can use the money in ways it likes to use so it's a very valuable asset I don't want to give you an, a figure on it but uh, we would not sell it uh, we certainly wouldn't want to sell it for its, 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 its float value. And if that float is negative, it's shown on the balance sheet as a liability. So uh, uh, it's extraordinary. And it's taken a long time to build. It'd be very, very, very hard for anybody to, I don't think they could build anything like it. It just takes so long. And we continue to plow new ground if you went in the next room, you would have seen something called three, which is our movement toward uh, small and medium business owners for commercial insurance. And it's an online operation. And it will take all kinds, we'll do all kinds of mid-course adjusting and that, and that sort of thing. And we're only, we only just started up in four states. But we'll, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, that will be a significant asset, asset of Berkshire, just like Geico is growing from two and a fraction billion of premium to, you know, who knows, but well into the mid 30 billion, just with Tony Nicely. And when I said in the annual report that Tony Nicely, who's here today. Warren, is there anybody in the world who has a big casualty insurance business that you'd trade our business for that. No, no, we, 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 we really, it's taken a long time and it's taken some tremendous people. And Tony Nicely has created more than 50 billion with his associates, and he's got 39,000 of them, more than probably more now because he's growing this year. Uh, he's created more than $50 billion at Geico of value for Berkshire. At, uh, yeah. It's pretty much what you'd expect. It's, it's such an easy business taking in money now in cash and just keeping the books and giving a little of it back. There's a lot of stupidity gets into it. And if you're not way better than average, 
add it, you're going to lose money in the end. It's a mediocre business for most people. Started out with and it's good at Berkshire only because we're a lot better at it. If we ever stop being a lot better at it, well, it wouldn't be safe for us either. And the G. Jane has done a similar thing. He's done it in a, in, in a variety of ways within the insurance business. But, but uh, I would not want to undo if somebody would have to give me more than $50 billion to undo everything he has produced <laughs> for Berkshire. And he walked into my office on a Saturday in the mid-1980s. He'd never been in the insurance business before. And uh, I, I don't think there's anybody in the insurance world that doesn't wish them, that he'd walked into their office instead of ours at Berkshire. It's been extraordinary. It's surely been extraordinary. But we have Tom Nerney, we have Tim Kennessy, we have at MedPro, we have Tom Nerney at U.S. Liability, we, we, we have at Guard Insurance, we only bought that a few years ago, and that's, that's a t terrific operation. It's based in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. Who would expect to find a great insurance operation in Wilkesbury? But we've got a great insurance, a really great insurance operation right here in Omaha, about two miles from here. And it was bought by us in 1967, and, and, and it changed, you know, it changed Berkshire. We built on that base. So we've got a, we've really got a great insurance business, and uh, I won't give you a number, but it's, it's probably a bigger number than you've got in your, <laughs> in your head for, uh, and it's worth more within Berkshire than it would be worth as an independent operation. Somebody can say, well, this little gem, if it was put out there, would sell at a higher multiple or something of the sort. It, it works much better as being part of a whole where we have had two tiny operations, two in, tiny insurance operations many, many years ago, and they, bet, they both went broke. They, when they were, the underwriting was bad, but we paid all the claims. We did not walk away. We paid every dime of claims, and uh, nobody worries about doing any kind of financial transaction with Berkshire. And, uh, you know, the, today, on Saturday, about 9 in the morning, we got a, I got a phone call, and, and people, we made a deal the next day committing Berkshire to pay out $10 billion. Uh, come hell or high water, no outs for, you know, uh, material adverse change or anything like that, and people know we'll be there with $10 billion, and they know in the insurance business when we write a policy that may come be payable during the worst catastrophe in history or may be payable 50 years from now, they know Berkshire will pay, and that's why we've got $124 billion of float. Is there any way that kids can develop the delayed gratification skill? I'll take that because I'm a specialist in delayed gratification. I've had a lot of time to delay it. And, and uh, my answer is that they sort of come out of the womb with the delayed gratification thing, or they come out of the womb where they have to have everything right now. And I've never been able to change them at all. So we identify it, we don't turn it in. Charlie's had eight children, so he's become more and more of a believer in, in nature versus nurture. <laughs> uh, You'll probably sign some nice old woman of about 95 out there in threadbare clothing, and she's delaying gratification right to the end and probably has 4,000 A shares. <laughs> it's just these second and third generation types that are buying all the jewelry. It's interesting, if you think about, we'll, we'll take it to a broader point, but if you think of the long, a 30-year government bond paying 3%, and you allow for, as an individual, paying some taxes on the 3% you'll receive, and you'll have the Federal Reserve Board saying that their objective is to have 2% inflation, you'll really see that, uh, that delayed gratification if you own a long government bond, is that you know you get to you get to go to Disneyland and ride the same number of rides 30 years from now that you would if you did it now. The, the, the low interest rates for people who 
invest in fixed dollar investments uh, really mean that uh, you really aren't going to, you know, get have eat steak later on if you eat hamburgers now, which is what I used to preach to my wife and children and anybody else that would listen many years ago. But, uh, uh, so it's, I don't necessarily think that, that uh, for all families in all circumstances that saving money is, is uh, necessarily the best thing to do in life. I mean, you know, it, uh, uh, if you really, if you really tell your kids they can, whatever it may be, they never go to the movies or will never go to Disneyland or something of the sort, because if I save this money 30 years from now, you know, we'll, we'll be able to stay a week instead of two days. I think, I think there's a lot to be said for doing things that, that bring you and your family enjoyment rather than trying to save every dime. And, uh, uh, so uh, I advise... The de delayed gratification is not uh, necessarily a, an unqualified uh, 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 course of action under all circumstances. Uh, I always believed in spending two or three cents out of every dollar I earned, <laughs> saving the rest. <laughs> but I, I really, I've, I've always had everything I wanted. I mean, one thing you should understand, uh, if you aren't happy, having $50,000 or $100,000, you're not going to be happy if you have $50 million or $100 million. I mean, it, it, uh, the, a certain amount of money does make you feel, and those feel around you feel better just in terms of being more secure in some cases. But, but uh, loads and loads of money. I, I probably know as many rich people as just about anybody. And uh, uh, I do not... I don't think they're happier because they get super rich. I think they're, I think they are, they are happier when they don't have to worry about money. But uh, you don't see a correlation between happiness and money uh, beyond a certain place. So don't go overboard on delayed gratification. Would you ever consider having Greg and Ajit join you on stage at future annual meetings? and allow us to ask questions of them and Ted and Todd as well, so we can get a better sense of their thinking. That's probably a pretty good idea, and we've talked about it. We have, we have Greg and Ajit here, and any questions that anybody wants to direct on them, it's very easy to move them over. And, and uh, so we, we thought about having four of us up here. And we, uh, uh, and this format is not set in stone at all. It, uh, I can tell you that, actually the truth is Charlie and I are afraid of looking bad. The, those guys are better than we are. <laughs> the, uh, you could not have two better operating managers than, than, uh, than Greg and Ajit. I mean, they, it's just fantastic what they accomplish. They know the business is better. They work harder by far. And you were absolutely invited to ask questions that, that to be directed over to them at this meeting. Uh, yeah, this, this format will not be around forever. And if it's better to get them up on the stage, we're, we'll be happy to do it. Ted and Todd, uh, they're basically not going to answer investment questions. We, we regard investment decisions is proprietary, basically. They belong to Berkshire. And uh, we are not an investment advisory organization. Uh, so it, that, that, that is counter to the interests of Berkshire for them to be talking about securities they own. It's a counter to the interest of Berkshire for Charlie or me to, to be doing it. We've done better because we don't publish every day what we're buying and selling. I mean, it, 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 if somebody's working on a new product at Apple or somebody's working at a, on a new drug or they're assembling property or something of the sort, they do not go out and tell everybody in the world exactly what they're doing every day. And we're trying to generate ideas and investment, and we, we do not believe in telling the world what, we, what we're doing every day, except to the extent that we're legally required. But it's a good idea, Charlie.
Well, one of the reasons we have trouble with these questions is because we're, Berkshire is so very peculiar. There's only one thing like it. We have a different kind of unbureaucratic way of making decisions. There aren't any people in headquarters. Uh, we don't have endless committees deliberating forever and making bad decisions. We just, we're radically different. and. It's awkward being so different, and, but I don't want to be like everybody else because this has worked better. So I think you're just going to have to endure us. <laughs> we, we do think that it's a huge corporate asset, which may only surface very occasionally, and depending very much on how the world is around us. But to be the one place, I think, in the world almost, where uh, somebody can call on a Saturday morning and, and meet on Sunday morning and have a $10 billion commitment, and nobody in the world doubts whether that commitment will be upheld, and it's not subject to any kind of uh, welching on the part of the company that's doing it. It's, it's got nothing involved other than Berkshire's word, and, and that's an asset that every now and then will be worth uh, a lot of money to Berkshire, and I don't really think it will be subject to competition. And Ted and Todd, in particular, uh, are an additional pipeline and have proven to be an additional pipeline in terms of uh, facilitating uh, the exercise of that ability. I mean, they, they, things come in through them. But for one reason or another, uh, I might not hear about otherwise. So they've exp they have expanded our universe. In the markets we've had in recent years, that hasn't been important. I can see periods where they would be enormously valuable. Just take the question that was raised by the fellow from Winnipeg about weak covenants and bonds. I mean, we, we, we could have a situation uh, who knows when, who knows where, or who knows whether. But we could have a situation where there could be massive defaults in the junk bond type market. We've had those a couple times, and we made a fair amount of money off of them. But Ted and Todd would multiply our effectiveness in a big way if such a period comes along, or some other types of periods come along. They are, they're, they're very, very, very useful uh, to Berkshire. The call happened to come in on Friday from Brian Moynihan, of, of uh, CEO of Bank of America, and has done an incredible job. But we have a better chance of, of uh, getting more calls and having them properly filtered and everything appropriately filtered the next time conditions get chaotic uh, than we did last time, and that's, that's important. Charlie, yeah. Well, I do think it's true that if the world goes to hell in a handbasket, hand that you, you people will be in the right company. We've got a lot of cash, and we know how to behave well in a panic. Uh, and if the world doesn't go to hell, are things so bad now? <laughs> and I also want to report that your vice chairman is getting new social distinction. I've been invited during this gathering to go to a happy hour put on by the Bitcoin people. <laughs> and I've tried to figure out what the Bitcoin people do in their happy hour, and I finally figured it out. They celebrate the life and work of Judas Iscariot. Is your invitation still good? 
<laughs> well, Bitcoin, actually, on my honeymoon in 1952, my bride, 19, and I, 21, uh, stopped in Las Vegas. We just got in my aunt. Alice gave me the car and said, have a good time, and we went west. So we stopped in the Flamingo, and I looked around, and I saw all of these well-dressed, they dressed better in those days, well-dressed people who had come, in some cases, thousands of miles away. And this was before jets, so transportation wasn't as good. And they came to do something that every damn one of them knew was mathematically dumb. And I told Susie, I said, we are going to make a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, imagine people going to stick money on some roulette number with a zero and a double zero there and knowing the percent. They all could do it, and they, they just do it. And I have to say, Bitcoin has, re, has rejuvenated that feeling in me. <laughs> I was kind of surprised, though, to see you move to trim all of your holdings where possible on a regular basis to eliminate the regulatory requirements that come with ownership levels above 10 percent, which, in my view, limits the investable universe that Berkshire, at least Warren, can meaningfully invest in longer term, given that Warren manages a large chunk of Berkshire's $200 million, billion dollar equity portfolio. Could you elaborate more on the regulatory impact for Berkshire of holding more than 10 percent of any company's stock? as well as how you feel about the Fed's recent proposal to allow uh, investors like Berkshire to own up to 25 percent of the shares of the bank without triggering more restrictive rules and oversight. Yeah, the 10 percent, there's a couple of reasons. That's the right answer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's two factors um, beyond, in the case of banks, there's the Federal Reserve requirement there. but. Uh, many people probably don't even, might, might not know about this, but if you own over 10 percent of a security, common stock, and you sell it within six months of the profit, you give the money over to the company. Uh, you're, you're, it's a short swing profit that you're not, you give them, and you match your any sale uh, against your lowest purchase. And I think if you sell it and then buy it within six months, I'm not as positive about that because I haven't really read the rule for a lot of years, but, but I think if you sell it, if you sell and then buy within six months and the purchase is below the price at which you made the sale, you owe the money to the company. There used to be lawyers that would scan uh, that monthly SEC report that I used to get 30 or 40 years ago, they would scan it to find people that inadvertently had broken that rule, and they would get paid a fee for recovering it for the company. So it restricts enormous, it restricts significantly your ability to reverse a position or change your mind or something of the sort. Uh, secondly, I think you have to report within two or three business days every purchase you make once you're in that over 10 percent factor. So you're advertising to the world, and the world tends to follow us some. So it really, it has a huge execution cost attached to it. Nevertheless, and those are both significant minuses, and they're both things that people generally don't think about. We did go over recently, for example, in Delta Airlines. That was actually an accident, but I'm, I don't mind the fact that all that we did. and. Um, if the Federal Reserve changes its, its uh, approach, we won't have to trim down below that. We don't want to become a bank holding company, and we don't want to. Uh, uh, we went in many years ago and got permission with Wells, but then our, our permission expired, and we went in again a few a couple of years ago, and, and then we spent a year or so, and there were just a million questions that Wells got asked about us and so on. So it. It's been a deterrent. It'll be less of a deterrent in the future, but it does have those two, two, the short swing thing is less onerous to us than it would be to most people who buy and sell stocks, because we don't really think in terms of doing much with But if we didn't have all these damn rules, 
we would cheerfully buy more, wouldn't we? Sure. Sure. Well, anytime we buy, we do it cheerfully. But uh, the uh, yeah, we and and we will. You'll probably see us at more than ten percent in in more things. Uh, that, and if the Fed if the Fed should change its rules, there there will be companies where we drift up over ten percent simply because they're repurchasing their shares. That's been the case with Wells, and and, and it's. Uh, been the case with an airline or two um, in the last year or so. Um, oh, if, we, if we like 9.5 percent of a company, we'd we would like 15 percent better. Uh, and you may you may see us behave a little differently on that in the future. Well, one more awkward disadvantage of being extremely rich. Yeah. <laughs> and it really is. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, and and being and 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 people following you. I mean, yeah, the, the followers problem can be a real problem. At, um... How did you know you were ready to manage other people's money, and what general advice would you give to someone in my shoes? Well, it's a very interesting question because I I faced that and and uh, I sold securities for a while, but in, in May of 1956. I had a number of members of my family. I'd come back from New York, and they wanted me to help them out with stocks as I had earlier before I'd taken a job in New York. And I said I did not want to get in the stock sales business, but I, I enjoyed investing. I was glad to figure out a way to do it, which I did through a partnership form. But I would not have done that if I thought there was any chance, really that I would lose the money. And what I was worried about was not how I would behave, but how they would behave. Because I, I needed people who were in sync with me. So when we sat down for dinner in May of 1956 with seven people who either were related to me or one was a roommate in college and his mother, and uh, uh, I, I showed him the partnership agreement. I said, you don't need to read this. You know, there's no way that I'm doing anything in the agreement that, that uh, there's any way that, you know, you don't need a lawyer to read or anything of the sort. But I said, here are the ground rules as to what I think I can do and how I want to be judged. And if you're in sync with me, I want to manage your money because then I, I won't worry about the fact that you will panic if the market goes down or somebody tells you something different. So we have to be on the same page. And if we're on the same page, then I'm not worried about managing your money. And if we aren't on the same page, I don't want to manage your money because you may be disappointed when I think that things are even better to be investing and so on. So I don't think I don't think you want I don't think you want to manage other people's money until you have a vehicle and can reach the kind of people that will be in sync with you. I think you ought to have your own ground rules as to what your expectations are, when they should send you roses, and when they should throw bricks at you, and you want, you want to be on the same—and and, uh, that's one reason I never—we didn't have a single institution in the partnership, because institutions meant committees, and committees meant that— yeah, You had some ants that trusted you. What's that? You had some ants who trusted you. Yeah, well, and a father-in-law that gave me everything he had in the world, you know, but— and I, I didn't mind taking everything he had in the world, as long as he would stick with me uh, and wouldn't get panicked by headlines and, and that sort of thing. And, and so it's very, it's enormously important that you don't take people that have expectations of you that you can't meet. And that means you turn down a lot of people. It means you probably start very small and you get an audited record. And when you've got the confidence where if your own parents came to you and they were going to give you all their money and you were going to invest for them, if you've got the kind of confidence that you'll say, I may not get the best record, but I'll be sure that you get a decent record over time, uh, that's when you're ready to go on it. The, uh, Let me tell you a story that I tell young lawyers who frequently come to me and say, how can I quit practicing law and become a billionaire instead? <laughs> and so I say, well, that reminds me of a story they told about Mozart. A young man came to him and he said, I want to compose symphonies and I want to talk to you about that. And Mozart said, how old are you? And the man said, 22. 
and Mozart said, you're too young to do symphonies. And the guy says, but you were writing symphonies when you were 10 years old. He says, yes, but I wasn't running around asking other people how to do it. <laughs> Carol, we wish you well. And, yeah. but, <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and actually, we really do, because the fact you asked that sort of a question is, in, to some extent, indicative of the fact that you got the right attitude going in. <laughs> it isn't that easy to be a great investor. Uh, I don't think we've quite made it. In its SEC filings, said it. Berkshire does not have to give information about foreign stocks it holds. Assuming we hold foreign stocks, could you please tell us what our far, five largest positions are? Uh, another fellow wants investment information. We, are, we really aren't in the investment information business. We, we disclose what we have to disclose, but uh, we, we, could, we could set up an advisory, investment advisory firm and probably take in a lot of money, but we haven't done it, and uh, we aren't giving away what belongs to our shareholders for nothing. But he's correct. I, I, I'm 99 percent sure he's correct, and Mark Hamburg can correct me but, uh, from our office. But we do not have to report foreign stocks, and uh, uh, we do have, in, in, in certain important countries, there's lower thresholds at which we have to report our holdings uh, as a percentage of the company's stock outstanding, there's lower thresholds than there are in the United States. So in a sense, in, in certain stocks, uh, I think when we bought Munich Re stock or bought Tesco stock, or there's certain stocks we've had to report at before we would have had to report in the United States. But we will, we will never unnecessarily uh, advise uh, if we plan to buy uh, some land someplace, if we plan to develop a business, we are not, a, we are not about giving business information that is proprietary to Berkshire. We don't give it unless we are required by law, and, and he is correct that I am virtually certain that we do not have to report our, our foreign stocks to, uh, uh, on the SEC filings, that, uh, and he will have to find his own holdings. Uh, in Austria, I don't. But, uh, I think his Mozart uh, story may have encouraged that particular question from Austria. <laughs> what, what stocks we're going to own in Austria? Precision Caspar's pre-tax profit margins, while perfectly fine relative to American industry as a whole, continue to be almost 10 percentage points below where they were in the years preceding the acquisition, and I'm guessing they're lower than contemplated when the purchase price was determined. Is the downward trend in earnings since 2015 mostly due to these transitory items, or ha have the competitive structure of the industry and Precision's relationship with its customers changed to the point that meaningful increases from current margin levels are probably unlikely? Your prelude is, is quite correct. I mean, they are below what we projected uh, a few years ago, and uh, my expectation, uh, but I would have told you this a year ago, and they have, Im they have grown, improved somewhat. Uh, my expectation is, based on the contracts we have and the fact that initial, the initial years uh, in anything in the aircraft industry, for example, uh, tend to be less profitable as, as you go further down the, the learning curve and the volume curve, uh, tend to be lower in the, in, the, in the near term. My expectation is uh, that the earnings of precision will, will uh, improve fairly significantly. And I think I mentioned maybe to you last year, in those earnings, there is about $400 million a year of purchase amortization, which our economic earnings in our, in our, uh, in my viewpoint, but I, even including that 400 million a year, which they would be reporting if they were independent, and we don't report because we bought them and there's a purchase amortization charge. Even, even without that, they are below what I would anticipate by a fair margin. Uh, 
within a year or two. That, that's the present expectation on my part. Uh, Charlie? No, I don't have any. Yeah. You'll have that question for me next year. And, yeah, and uh, the, I think I'll be giving you a different answer. You mentioned that the older you get, the more you understood about human nature. Could you elaborate more about what you've learned and how can the differences of human nature help you make a better investment? You should wait for Charlie's answer because he's even older. <laughs> he can tell you more about being old than I can even. The, uh, it's absolutely true that virtually any, any uh, yardstick you use, I'm going downhill. If I would take a SAT test now, and you could compare it to a score of when I was in my early 20s, I, I think it'd be quite embarrassing. Uh, and it's certainly, Charlie and I can give you a lot of examples, and there's others we won't tell you, about uh, how things decline as you get older. But I would, I would say this, it's absolutely true in my view that, that uh, you can and should understand human behavior better as you do get older. You just have more experience with it. And I don't think you can read, Charlie and I read every book we could on every subject we were interested in, you know, when we were very young. And we learned a, an enormous amount just from what, from other, studying the lives of other, of other people. And, but I don't think you can really, I don't think uh, you can, get to be an expert on human behavior at all uh, by reading books, no matter what your IQ is, no matter who the teacher is. And uh, I think that you really do learn a lot about human behavior. Sometimes you have to learn it by having multiple experiences. Um, I think you, I think, I actually think I, despite all the other shortcomings, and I can't do mental arithmetic as fast as I used to, and I can't, I can't read as fast as I used to, but I, I do think that I know a lot more about human behavior than I did when I was 25 you, or 30. If you want one mantra, it comes from a Chinese gentleman who just died, Lee Kuan Yew, who was the greatest nation builder probably that ever lived in the history of the world. And he said one thing over and over and over again all his life, figure out what works and do it. You just go at life with that simple philosophy from your own national group, you will find it works wonderfully well. Figure and, out what works and do it. And figuring out what works means figuring out how other people of course. behave. Of course. And, and Charlie and I have seen the extremes in human behavior and uh, in so many unexpected ways. And uh, Now we get it every night. Yeah. Extremes of human behavior. Yeah. All you got to do is turn on the television. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad he used that example. <laughs> For Mr. Ajit Jain and Mr. Warren Buffett, you have said that you communicate regularly about unconventional insurance contracts that expose the company to extremely unlikely but highly costly events. I'm curious about how you think about and safely price these unconventional insurance contracts. Ajit, why don't you answer first if you'd like to? Hi. Um, obviously, the starting point, I mean, these, un uh, these situations where there's not enough risk, not enough data to hang our hat on, it's more of an art than a science. Uh, we start off with as much science as we can use, looking at historical data that, that relates to the risk in particular or something that cl comes close to relating to the risk that we're looking at. And then beyond that, if there's not enough historical data we can look at, then clearly we have to make a judgment in terms of what are the odds of something like that happening. We try, we absolutely, in situations like that, we absolutely make sure we cap our exposure so that if something bad happens or if we got something wrong, we absolutely know that how much money we can lose and whether we can absorb that loss without much pain to the income statement or the balance sheet. Uh, in terms of art, it's, it's a difficult situation. More often than not, it's impossible to have a point of view, and we end up passing on it. 
but every now and then we think we can get a price where the subjective odds we have of something like that happening has a significant margin of safety in it. So we feel it's a risk that's worth taking. And then finally, the absolute acid test is, I pick up the phone and call Warren. Say, Warren, here's the deal. What do you think? <laughs> it's not easy, and you wouldn't want just anybody doing no. it for you. No. The, no. No. In fact, the only one I would want doing it for us on, on the kind of things we have sometimes received is a G. I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple. There isn't anybody, there isn't anybody like him. Uh, and as Ajit said, we'll, we'll look at a worst case, but we are willing, if we like the odds, and like you say, there's no way to look these up. I, we can tell you how many, you know, uh, or how many 6.0 or greater earthquakes have happened in the last 100 years in, in uh, Alaska or California or so on. And we, we, there's a lot of things you can look up figures on. Now, sometimes those are useful and sometimes they aren't, but there's a lot where you can get a lot of data. And then there's others that, uh, well, after 9-11, you know, was that going to be the first of several other attacks that were going to happen very quickly? There were planes flying that couldn't well, they couldn't land in Hong Kong, as I remember. I think it was Cafe Pacific. Uh, couldn't land in Hong Kong the following Monday unless they had a big liability uh, coverage placed with somebody. Uh, I mean, the world had to go on. The people that held mortgages on the Sears Tower and all of a sudden wanted a coverage, or I'm, I'm just I think that actually was one, but there were, they were just pouring in of people that were, hadn't been worried about something a week earlier, and now they were worried about things involving huge sums. And there were really only a couple people in the world that would even listen and had the, and had the capacity to take on a lot of the deals we were proposed. And there's no book to look up. So you do, there's a big element of judgment. Ajit and I, uh, I mean, Jeet's a hundred times better at this than I am, but we do tend to think alike uh, on this sort of thing. You don't want to think too much alike, but, but we think alike. I've got a willingness to lose a lot of money. And, and uh, most, well, virtually every insurance company, if they get up to higher limits, they've got treaties in place and they can only take this much. And they, uh, So the world was paralyzed on that. We don't get those. We, now, obviously, but we do occasionally get inquiries about doing things that really nobody else in the, the world can do. It's a little like our investment situation, only transferred over the insurance. Uh, we don't build the business around it, but we are ready when the time comes. And, and Ajit is an asset that no other company in the world has. And, uh, we work him, <laughs> and, and we actually enjoy a lot talking to each other about these kind of risks because uh, he'll ask me to think about what the price should be, and he'll think about we don't tell each other ahead of time, and, and then I'll name it, and then he'll say, "Have you lost your mind, Warren?" You know, <laughs> he, and then he'll point something out to me that I've overlooked, and it's a lot of fun, and it's made us a lot of money, and. Uh, the shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway are extraordinarily like you can't hire people like a G. I mean, it, it, you know, you, you get them, you get them once in a lifetime. Charlie, I don't think we helped him very much. It's really difficult. There will be a time when I mean, I probably won't be around then, but there will be a time occasionally just like in financial markets, when things are happening in the insurance world, and basically uh, Berkshire will be the only one, virtually the only one people, people turn to. But, uh, and, and but in the past, Aji talking to you has added more than $50 billion of dollars to the balance sheet at, of Berkshire by making these oddball calls. And if he, if he hadn't talked to me, it'd be probably $49.9 <laughs> Yeah, But, but it, 
but the, you don't want to try. The, don't try this at home. I mean, and, yeah, that, this is that doesn't mean it's easy. No, it, and, and it's not very teachable. I mean, it, no, it isn't very teachable. No, You're no, right. No, it is not. It is not something that that Berkshire has some secret formula someplace for it. It it, it basically is a is a very unusual talent with the jeet and uh, and. We're least. not holding anything back. It's hard. Kraft Heinz's recent challenges have raised questions about whether Berkshire's partnership with 3G has become a weakness for Berkshire. And would Berkshire be open to partnering again with 3G in a major acquisition? Yeah, they are our partners, and we, uh, we joined them uh, at a one-page agreement, which I haven't even actually never reread. I mean, it's, it's a Georgi e. Paolo I mean, is, a, is a good friend of mine. I think he's a marvelous human being. And uh, uh, I'm pleased we made that we are partners. It's conceivable that something would come up. Uh, they have more of a taste for leverage than we do, and they probably have more of a taste for paying up, but they also are uh, in certain types of situations, they'd be way better operators than we would. I mean, they go into situations that that need improvement, and they have improved them. But uh, I think both they and we—I know we—have uh, did underestimate not not what the consumer is doing so much, but what the retailer is. And uh, at Seeds Candy, we sell directly to the consumer, but at Kraft Heinz, they're intermediaries. And the question, and those intermediaries are trying to make money, we're trying to make money. And the brand is our protection against the intermediaries, make, intermediaries making all the money. Costco tried to drop Coca-Cola back in, I think, 2008. And you can't drop Coca-Cola. Uh, you know, and, and, and not disappoint a lot of customers. Snickers bars are the number one uh, candy that Mars makes them. And they've been number one, I think, for 30 or 40 years. And, and if you walk into a, a drugstore and the guy says, I've got the Snickers is 75 cents or whatever it might be, and I've got this special little bar we make, my, my wife and I make in the back of the store, and it's only 50 cents, and it's just as good. You don't buy it. You, you know, next, when you're at the, some other place, the next time you buy the Snickers bar. So it, brands are, can be enormously valuable, but many of the brands uh, are dependent, most of them. Geico is not. Geico goes directly to the consumer. If we save the consumer money on insurance, they're going to buy it from us. And uh, our brand, you know, and we'll spend well over a billion and a half on advertising this year. And you think, my God, we started this in 1936, and we were saying the same thing then about saving 15 percent in 15 minutes or something. It was hard, not exactly the same, but but it, that brand is is huge, and we have to we have to come through on the promise we give, which is to to save people significant money on insurance, a great many people. That brand is huge, and we're dealing directly with the consumer. And when you're selling Kool-Aid or ketchup or, or you know, Heinz 57 sauce or something, you are going through a channel, and they would, as the phrase was used earlier today, you know, our gross margin is their opportunity, and we think, we think that the, cust the ultimate consumer is going to force them to have our product and that we will get the gross margin. And that, that, that fight, that tension has increased in the last five years, and I think it's likely to increase in the next five or ten years. And Charlie is a director of a company that has caused me to think a lot about that subject. Charlie? Well, what I think is interesting about the 3G situation. There was a long series of transactions that worked very well. And finally, there was one transaction at the end that didn't work so well. That is a very normal outcome of success in a big place with a lot of young men who want to get rich quick. 
and it just happens again and again. And, and it's, you want to be careful. It's so much easier to take the good ideas and push them for wretched excess. Yeah, well, uh, uh, no idea is good at any price, and that, uh, the, the price element is probably something that, that we worry more about generally than our partners, but we are their partners in Kraft Heinz, and it's not at all inconceivable that we could be partners in, in, in some other transaction in the future. 3G's playbook of cutting R&D looks to have stifled new product development and missed changing preferences. So here's my question. Why continue to hold when the moat appears to be dry, or do you think it is filling back up? I, I don't think the problem was that they cut research or something. I think the problem was they paid a little too much for the last acquisition. Yeah, Jell-O. I, I, I can't give you the exact figure. There's certain brands that may be declining two percent a year, three percent a year, in, in in unit sales, and there's others that are growing one or two percent. I mean, there's not dramatic changes taking place uh, at all. I mean, Kraft Heinz is earning more money than Kraft and Heinz were earning six or seven years ago. I mean, uh, that, that, and, and the products are being used in a huge way. Now, it's true that certain, that there are always trends going to some degree, but they have not fallen apart remotely. Uh, and they have widened the margin somewhat, but it is tougher in terms of the margin and the price negotiations probably to go through the to the to the actual consumer that has become a somewhat more tougher passageway for all food companies uh, than it was ten years ago. It's still a terrific business. I mean, you know, you mentioned Jello or Velveeta. Charlie works at my grandfather's grocery store in 1940. I worked there in 41, and if. Uh, they were buying those products then. They buy the products now. The margins are still very good. They earn terrific returns on invested capital. But we paid too much in the case of, in the case of Kraft. But, uh, uh, you can pay too much for a growing brand. I mean, uh, the, the, you can pay way too much for a growing brand. It'd probably be easier to be sucked into that. Uh, so I, I, don't, I, I basically don't worry about the brands, certain of them are very strong, um, and certain number are de declining a bit. Uh, but that was the, that was the case ten years ago. It'll be the case ten years from now. But it's not. It, there's nothing dramatic happening in that. Apple is now our largest holding. Tell us more about your thinking. What do you think about the regulatory challenges the company faces? But again, we're not. We, we, I will tell you that all of the things, the points you've made. I'm aware of, and I like our Apple holdings very much. I mean, it is our largest holdings. And actually, what hurts in the case of Apple is that the stock has gone up. And we'd much rather have the stock, and I'm not proposing anything be done about it, but we'd much have to, rather have the stock at a lower price so we could buy more stock. And importantly, uh, if Apple, I think they authored another, authorized another $75 billion, the other day, but let's say they're going to spend $100 billion in buying in their stock in the next three years. You know, it's very simple. If they buy it at 200, they're going to get 500 million shares. They've got 4 billion, 600 million out now, and so they'll end up with 4.1 billion under that circumstance. If they're buying it at 150, they buy in 667 million shares. And instead of owning what we would own the first case, we now the divisor would be less than $4 billion, and we'd own a greater percentage of it. So in effect, a, a major portion of, of earnings, at least possibly, has been, it's at least been authorized, will be spent in terms of increasing our ownership without us paying out a dime, which I love for a business, a, a wonderful business. And uh, the recent development when the stock has moved up substantially, actually hurts Berkshire over time. We will still do 
my opinion, will do fine. But we're not going to get into, uh, uh, we're not going to dissect uh, our expectations about Apple, you know, for people who may be buying it against us tomorrow or something. We don't, we don't give away investment advice on that for nothing. But we have all the, pro all the things you've mentioned, obviously, we, we know about. We know some. We, we've got a whole bunch of other variables that we crank into it. And we like the fact that it's our largest holding. Charlie? Well, in my family, the people who have Apple phones, it's the last thing they'll give up. Not a bad item to have. Can you explain what is driving the difference in profitability between Burlington Northern and Union Pacific, as theoretically we should not see that wide of a spread between two similar sized companies that are basically competing for the same business with the same customers in the western half of the United States? Well, Warren knows the answer to that a lot better than I do. My guess is that they work a little harder than we do at building the rates. But, uh, Warren, you answer that. Yeah, well, we, it's true that we, we receive the lowest ton mile revenue of any of the six big railroads in uh, North America. And uh, uh, there's some explanation for that, obviously, a significant explanation in the particular types of hauls we have and that sort of thing. We do have longer hauls generally. But the answer. Uh, Union Pacific's profit margin, they, they, they talk about operating ratios, but that goes back to the Interstate Commerce Commission. It's really profit margin, pre-tax, pre-interest profit margin. <clears throat> and the Union Pacific, uh, at one time, uh, probably uh, 15 or maybe a little more years ago, they, they really... Uh, uh, went off the track, so to speak, uh, but they've done a uh, a very good job of getting. Uh, well, they got a lot of uh, underpriced coal contracts worked out, as as did we. But they've also they've they've, they've done a very good job on expenses, and and uh, uh, there's no fundamental reason why the BNSF. Uh, franchise. I always like the Western Railroads better than the Eastern, I'm not by a dramatic margin, but I, I, I think the West will do better in terms of ton miles over time than the Eastern Roads. And uh, we've got some great routes, some of which were underwater in March for a while. And we pay a lot of attention uh, to what's going on at the Union Pacific, as we should. and. It's not like we're losing business to anybody, but we, they have been operating uh, at more efficiently, in effect, uh, than we have during the last few years. And uh, like I say, we take notice of it. They've, they've cut a lot of people. I mean, in, right here at Omaha. And uh, uh, we'll see what that does in terms of passenger or, or, or in terms of shipper satisfaction. But we are measuring ourselves very carefully against what they do, and and if it, if changes are needed, we'll we'll do them. It's a we've got a wonderful asset in that business. And when I bought it, I said it's for 100 years. It's for a lot more than 100 years. It is a very very fundamental business, and uh, we've got a wonderful uh, franchise, and we should. Uh, have margins comparable to other railroads. Really? I don't know much about it. <laughs> yeah. What do you value the most in life now? Well, well I like to have a little more of it. <laughs> 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 It's, it's the two things you can't buy, time and love, and that, uh, I value those for a long time, and, and I've been very, very, very lucky in life in being able to control my own time to extreme degree. Charlie's always valued that, too. That's, that's why we really wanted to have money, was so we could do what we damn pleased, basically, in our life. <laughs> it wasn't 
six houses or boats or anything. But, well, Charlie's got a boat, but it, it doesn't do us that much good. But, but time uh, is valuable, and that's—, that's uh, and we are very, very lucky to be in jobs where physical ability doesn't make any difference. And, you know, we, we, we've got the perfect job for a couple of guys with aging bodies. And uh, we get to do what we love to do every day. I mean, I literally, I, I could do anything that money could buy pretty much. And uh, I'm having more fun doing what I do than doing anything else. And Charlie is designing, designing dormitories. And I mean, he, he's got an interesting life and, and uh, he brings a lot to it. He still reads, you know, more books in a, in a week than I get done in a month, and he remembers what he reads. And so we've got it very good, but we, we don't have unlimited time. And, and whatever we do to free up the time to do what we like to do, and we both maximize that in our lives, uh, we do. Anybody's lucky if he gets so what he spends his time at, he really likes doing. That's, that's a blessing. Yeah, we, we've had so much good luck in life, it's, it, it, it sort of blows your mind, it's, it's starting with being, being born in the United States. And uh, Canada would be fine, too, incidentally. I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> Since investing in publicly owned stocks is so much a part of Berkshire's business, why do you not tell us every year how our portfolio performed? Well, I would say it could be calculated fairly easily, and, and it is, it's about 40 percent of Berkshire's value, but 60 percent is the businesses. And, and if you look at the top 10 stocks, I would guess that, you know, you're, you're down to where beyond those 10 stocks, uh, you're talking about less than, probably less than 10 percent of Berkshire's uh, value. So I. Again, we, we're not in the business of explaining why we own a stock. We're not looking for people to compete to buy it. We have a portfolio of companies where I would say that of that 200 billion or so, at least 150 billion of them are buying in their stock and increasing our interest every year. And why in the world should we want to uh, tell a whole bunch of people to go out and buy those stocks so that we end up paying, or the company on our behalf ends up paying more money for them. I mean, it, it, uh, people can get very happy when their stocks go up, but if we're going to own whatever, whether it's uh, uh, Bank of America, whether it's Apple, whether it's any of the big holdings, we will do considerably better in the next 10 years if their stocks do terribly during certain periods and that they buy lots of stock and it's just exactly like buying it ourselves except we're using their uh, they're, they're, they're using our money but it, uh, it, it's so elementary uh, and why in the world would we want to go out and tell the world that that these stocks should go up uh, so that maybe they can sell or something when it costs us money and we're not going to be able to move in and out of the stocks to our advantage so uh, our, our holdings are filed quarterly, our domestic holdings, as it was pointed out earlier, are filed quarterly, but we are, we would rather not tell the world what we own anymore than we'd like to tell them what our strategy is at NetJets or what our, you know, what we're going to do at Lubrizol and what we're working on the way of, of uh, better uh, advance, advances and in, in, in additives or whatever it may be, or where we plan to build a new store for the furniture mart or something. That's proprietary information, and we have to disclose a certain amount, but we're certainly not going to be touting our, the stocks to the other people. And in terms of calculating our performance, you can take the top 10 or 12 stocks, and anybody can make the calculation. I mean, at the end of the year, the Wall Street Journal runs, or all the papers run something where it says a year-to-date performance or something of the sort. So that's a simple calculation. The New York Times spoke to engineers who said that Boeing explicitly designed the MAX in a matter that allowed airline customers to avoid paying for simulators to train their pilots. 
Do you expect the worldwide regulatory and commercial response to the MAX's problems to result in increased demand for flight safety simulators? And could you please more generally discuss flight safety's competitive position and growth prospects? Flight safety is, their specialty would be with corporate pilots. They train, they train the, our, our NetJets pilots, for example. They have a major facility with simulators for that. I don't think what's happened with the 737 MAX will have any particular effect. I mean, we, we have, I don't know how many of the Fortune 100 companies that we do business with, it's, but it's a very significant percentage, and they train their pilots uh, with flight safety because we've got the talent and the simulators uh, like nobody else has for that business. And uh, Charlie, my, didn't you have that friend of yours that was trying to get Al Yoshi to pass him when he shouldn't? Well, you know, remember that story of your your friend that wanted to have flight safety? Oh yes. yeah. Yeah, credit. Why don't you tell me? I mean, Al Yoshi, who started flight safety with a few thousand dollars and a, a little little visual simulator or whatever it may have been at LaGuardia. I mean, he really cared about saving lives, and he 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 made a lot of money in the process, but. He was dedicated uh, throughout his lifetime to, uh, to truly uh, train better pilots and, 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 and uh, reduce the chance of, of accidents dramatically. It was a, it was a mission with him, and, and that, that spirit still continues. And, and as I say, we've got a, I can't tell you the percentages, I don't know, but I know it's very high of the of certainly the corporate business. We have, a lot, we have government business, we have, we have some airline business and all of that, but uh, uh, I don't expect any great change in the flight training business. But tell, tell them about your friend, Charlie. Well, of course, people pass those tests with flying colors and they, some of them just barely pass. And one of my friends just barely passed and they called me and told me it's uh, this is art in the business. Yeah. Flight safety would not. They care about everything. They, care. they watch the details. They care, and uh, and, and it's a, those simulators can they can cost over ten million dollars. I mean, just at, uh, uh, and they're dedicated, obviously, to a given uh, a given uh, uh, model of plane. You might find it interesting at NetJets. And that just, our pilots only fly one model. I mean, at, uh, most charters and all those, I'm sure they, and it's like they, they could fly other models and all of that, but we, we just want them, we want them to be flying one model and we give them a maximum amount of training annually. And it's, when I bought the company for Berkshire and I think it was 1998 or thereabouts, uh, you know, the thought obviously uh, bothered me that I would have a significant percentage of people would be friends of mine that were using it, and you know, and, and uh, you'd hate to have anything happen. I use it, my family uses it, uh, our managers use it, and uh, uh, there's nobody that cares more about safety. But I don't see than than at NetJets. It's it's a first class operation, and, and they've many, never many killed years. a passenger. Um, oh, they had uh, one pilot who hit a glider at 16,000 feet, and it was kind of a difficult landing. It was more they, than a difficult landing. They never killed landing. a pilot. It was a woman pilot, yeah. She was, and, and she was flying the next day. The co-pilot was kind of taken out of operation finally, but this woman ended up almost with a control panel in her lap because this guy had turned off his battery uh, and, and uh, hit one of our hawkers. And she had one shot at the runway. and. And she brought it in, and, and uh, we've, got, we've had some remarkable, remarkable uh, training and pilots there. I mean, uh, you should ask for her if you're flying on that jet. <laughs> I'm nine years old, and I'm excited to be at the Berkshire meeting, and this is my third year. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You should be rich by now. <laughs> Do 
you believe that you need to adapt your model of wide moats and strong brands to embrace, not avoid, technology? I think the answer is maybe. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think the answer is to put it on the board and it'll bring down the average age enormously. We won't get criticized as much. Uh, the, you're, you're exactly right in that uh, we do like moats, and we used to be able to identify them in a, in a newspaper that was the only newspaper in town or, or in TV stations where we, where we uh, felt the dominant positions and we felt the, the, uh, the product was underpriced in terms of advertising it. We saw it in brands sometimes. Uh, and it is true that, that in the tech world, if you can build a moat, it can be incredibly uh, valuable. I've not felt the confidence that I was the best one to judge that in many cases. It, uh, it wasn't hard to figure out who was winning at any given time or what their business was about, but there were a huge number of people that knew more about the game than I did. And we don't want to try and win in a game we don't understand. We may hire people, such as Ted and Todd, that are, are better at understanding certain areas of investing uh, than I am, or maybe even Charlie is. Uh, but you're, the principles haven't changed. You're right that some of the old ones have lost their moat. And you're, you're right that there are going to be companies in the future that have them that will be enormously valuable. And we hope we can identify one every now and then. But we won't, we'll still stay within what we, where we think we know what we're doing. And obviously we'll make mistakes even within that area. But we won't go into something because somebody else tells us it's a good thing to do. I mean, we, we, we are not going to subcontract your money to somebody else's judgment. You can take your money and, and follow somebody else's judgment, but we're not in the, we're not in the business of, of thinking that if we hire 10 people with specialties in this area or that, that it will lead to superior investment results. And we do worry that we may, we could blow a lot of money that way. So we'll do our best to, to enlarge the circle of competence of the people at Berkshire so that we don't miss so many. But we'll, we'll miss a lot in the future. We've missed a lot in the past. The main thing to do is to find things where our batting average is going to be high. And if we miss the biggest ones, that really doesn't bother us as long as the things we do with money work out OK. Charlie? Well, I think we've still got an awful lot of companies with big moats. Uh, and a lot of them are very, and some of our industrial brands were just incredibly strong in the niches we're in. Uh, so you, the Berkshire shareholders don't need to worry about we're just one big morass of unprofitability or anything like that. But we have not covered ourselves with glory in the new fields. Yeah. We won't end up all in buggy whips, though, or anything like that. But, uh, uh, but it's a very good question, and it's what we focus on all of the time. And We're I hope, trying to improve. And, and we hope you see, we see you back here for your fourth next year. Warren and Charlie, after your ownership has been completely distributed, will Berkshire be more vulnerable to activist investors? No, it's going to happen quite a few decades after my death. Yeah. It, I don't think I'll be bothered much by it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anything can happen. It's a low probability. It, it can't happen for a lot of years in terms of the way my stock gets distributed and in terms of the way other stock is held. But in the end, Berkshire should prove itself over time. I mean, there are no perpetuities, that, that, and uh, it, it needs to deserve to be continued in its present form. It, it has a lot of attributes that are uh, maximized by being in one entity, which people don't fully understand. They think if you spin off something that would command a high PE, that therefore value has been unlocked, which is to totally nonsense. I mean, it's already built in. Uh, and it, 
you know, one, one day out, you know, you might have an extra 3 percent or 5 percent in price, but over, over the years, we want to keep the wonderful businesses. But eventually, uh, I think the culture will remain one of a kind. I think that we will be able to do things other people can't do. I think that the advantages of having them in one spot will likely uh, be significant over time. And if that happens, uh, no activist uh, is going to take it over. And if, if the model doesn't work for some reason over a long period of time, then something else should happen. Progressive is gaining the most market share among the major auto insurers based on its presence in the direct and independent agency channels, as well as now bundling its auto and homeowners insurance coverage. How does GEICO plan on responding to competitive threats so that it can retain its place as the second largest auto insurer? Progressive is a very, very well-run business. GEICO is a very well-run business, and I think they will for a long time be the two companies that, that the rest of the auto insurance industry has trouble not losing share to. But I, there's, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I've always uh, thought for a long, long time, Progressive has been very well run. They, uh, they have an appetite for growth. Uh, sometimes they copy us a little, sometimes we copy them a little. And I think that'll be true five years from now and 10 years from now. And we sell substantial amounts of, of homeowners insurance. Uh, we have uh, an agency arrangement uh, with that. We were in the business of writing it ourselves until Hurricane Andrew, when a decision was made. We didn't control it then, but a decision was made that the uh, homeowners essentially, uh, you could lose as much in one year as you made in the previous 25 years, and the float isn't as large. So we became a company that, that placed our customers' desire for homeowners uh, with several other large and solid organizations. The big thing is auto insurance, and uh, we grew in the first quarter about 340,000 policies net, which will look quite good uh, compared to anybody but Progressive. That was quite a bit more than last year, but not as, not as good as two years ago. And the combined ratio, the, the profit margin was in the nine point uh, area. I feel extremely good about Geico. I mean, what, what has been built there by Tony and his people is perfect, but I would I would feel fine. Uh, uh, we, we don't own any Progressive, but I think that Progressive is an excellent uh, company, and uh, we will watch what they do, and they will watch what we do, and, and we will see five years from now or ten years from now uh, which one of us passes State Farm first. <laughs> Charlie? Oh, and, and G, would you like? The underwriting profit is really a function of two major variables. One is the expense ratio and the other is the loss ratio, without getting too technical. Uh, GEICO has a significant advantage over Progressive when it comes to the expense ratio, to the extent of about seven points or so. On the loss ratio side, Progressive does a much better job than GEICO does. They have, I think, about a 12-point advantage over GEICO. So net-net, Progressive is ahead by about five points. GEICO is very aware of this disadvantage on the loss ratio that they are suffering, and they're very focused in trying to bridge that gap as quickly as they can. They have a few projects in place, and you know, sometimes GEICO is ahead of Progressive. Right now, Progressive is ahead of GEICO, but I'm hopeful they'll catch up on the loss ratio side and maintain the expense ratio advantage as well. GEICO has gained market share, essentially. I'd have to look at the figures for sure, but virtually every year since Tony took over, and I would bet significant money that, that GEICO increases its market share in the next five years, and uh, um, it, I think it will for sure this year. And, and so it, 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 it is a terrific business, and uh, uh, 
Pro Progressive is a terrific business. And uh, we'll, uh, as Ajit says, we've, we've got the advantage in expenses and we will have an advantage in expenses. And then the question is, they have a very sophisticated way of pricing business. And uh, the question is whether we give some of that five points back or six points back or in terms of uh, loss ratio. And I, we are working very hard at that, but I'm sure they're working very hard too to improve their system. So it's a, to some extent, it's a two horse race and we've got a very good horse. But Warren, in the nature of things, every once in a while, somebody's a little better at something than we are. Huh. You've noticed. <laughs> yeah, I have noticed. Yeah. Uh. But, uh, yeah, I'd settle for second place in a lot of the business. My question is how to best emulate your success in building your circle of competence. Given the environment today in investing is a lot more competitive than when you started out, what would you do differently, if anything at all, when building your circle? Yeah, well, you're right. It is, a, it is much more competitive now than when I started. When I started, I literally could take the Moody's Industrial Manual, the Moody's Banks and Financial Manual, and I could go through page by page and I, at least run my, run my eyes over every company and think about which ones I might think more about. I would just do a lot, a whole lot of reading. I'd try and learn as much as I could about as many businesses, and I would try to figure out which ones I really had some important knowledge and understanding that was uh, probably different than overwhelmingly most of my competitors. And I would, I would uh, also try and figure out where, which ones I didn't understand. And I would focus on having as big a circle as I could have and, as, and also focus on being as realistic as I could about where the perimeters of my circle of competence were. I knew when I met Lorimer Davidson in January of 1951, I could get insurance. I mean, it, what he said made so much sense to me in the three or four hours I spent with him on that Saturday. So I dug into it and I, I, I could understand it. My mind worked well in that respect. I didn't think I could understand retailing. All I'd done was work for the same grocery store that Charlie had, and neither one of us learned that much about retailing, except it was harder work than we liked. And uh, you've got to do the same thing, and you've got way more competition now. But uh, if you get to know even about a relatively small area, more than other people do, and you don't feel a compulsion to act too often. You just you wait till the odds are strongly in your favor. Uh, it's still a very interesting game. It's harder than it used to be. Charlie? Well, I think the right strategy for the great mass of humanity is to specialize. Nobody wants to go to a doctor that's half proctologist and half dentist, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, well, and the, so the ordinary way to succeed is to narrowly specialize. Warren and I really didn't do that. And, that, and we didn't because we, we prefer the other type of activity. But I don't think we can recommend it to other people. Yeah, it was a little more treasure hunting in no, our day. And, and it was easy to spot the treasure. We made it work, but it was kind of a lucky thing. Yeah. It's You'll, not the standard way to go. The business at least I best understood, actually was insurance. I mean, I, uh, and, and I had very little competition. And, you know, I would, if I went to, I went to the insurance department in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I remember one time I drove there just to check on some Pennsylvania company. And this is when you couldn't get all this information on the internet. And I went in and I asked about some company and the guy said, you're the first one that's ever asked about that company. And uh, uh, there wasn't a lot. I went over to the Standard & Poor's Library on Houston, Houston Street, I guess they call it, and, and I would go up there and ask for all this obscure information, and there wasn't anybody sitting around there. They had a bunch of tables that you could sit and examine things through, and uh, so it was less competition. But if you know even one thing very well, um, it, it, it'll give you an edge at some point. At, uh, you know, it's what Tom Watson Sr. said at IBM, you know, uh, I'm no genius, 
but I'm smart in spots and I stay around those spots. And that's, that's basically what Charlie and I try to do, and I think that's probably what you can do, but you'll find that those spots. Yeah, we did it in several fields. That's hard. Yeah. And we got our head handed to us a few times, too. Yeah. Larry Fink of BlackRock has predicted that in the near future, all investors will be using ESG, environmental social governance metrics, to help determine the value of a company. I'm worried we don't score well on everything from climate to diversity to inclusion. How well do you think Berkshire measures up on those metrics, and are they valuable metrics? I think in reality we measure up well, but we don't, we don't participate in preparing reports for anybody that asks about it. And we have this, this idea that even though all shareholders are equal, we sort of, we, we prefer individual shareholders. We actually prefer people we know uh, as co-owners. And we don't want to be preparing a lot of reports and asking 60 subsidiaries each to do something where they'll, they'll set up a team and then mail things to headquarters and then we'll supply them to somebody who, if our stock goes up some, is probably going to sell it anyway. We want our managers to do the right things. We give them enormous latitude to do that, and I think that our batting average really is quite good. You saw the in the movie we talked about having 100 percent of the electricity we sell in Iowa come from essentially wind generation. Now, that doesn't mean that we get to do it 24 hours a day. We sell some and we buy it. But essentially, we will be creating as much wind energy as all of our customers use in electricity. There's one competitive, well, it's, it's, there's one other utility, electric utility, that's about our size and roughly our size in Iowa. And they have practically no wind uh, uh, resources. And uh, the wind blows where they exist too, but we have, we will have that 100 percent. As a matter of fact, it's a moving target because we do so well, uh, partly we do so well on, on, on wind generation that uh, a number of the high-tech companies want to locate in Iowa and get clean energy from us at very low prices, and therefore the moving target becomes our growth in customers in that area. But we're not going to put out a re we're not, we, we are not going to spend our, the time of the people at Berkshire Hathaway Energy uh, responding to questionnaires or trying to score better with somebody that is working on that. Uh, it's just uh, we trust our managers, and I think the performance is, is at least decent, and, uh, uh, and we keep expenses and needless reporting down to a minimum at Berkshire. We do not get... I mentioned this in the annual report. I don't. I can't imagine another company like it. But here we are, with 500 billion of market capitalization. We do not have a consolidated P&L monthly. We don't need it. You know, now, I can't imagine any other organization doing that. But we don't need it, and uh, we're not going to tie up resources, people, resources, doing things we don't need to do just because it's the sort of standard procedure of. In, in corporate America, and corporate America is very worried about, in general, they're very worried about uh, whether somebody's going to upset their apple cart, you know, and with activists and everything. So they want to be very sure that every shareholder is is happy on issues like that. And and, and the end, fortunately, we don't have to worry about that, so we don't have to run up a lot of expenses doing things that don't actually let us run the business uh, better. Charlie. Well, I think in Berkshire, the environmental stuff is done one level down from us. And I think Greg Abo is just terrific at it. And so I think we score very well. When it gets to so-called best corporate practices, I think the people who talk about them don't really know what the best practices are. They just know what they think are the best practices. And they determine that based on what will sell, not, not what will work. And so... I like our way of doing things better than theirs, and I hope to God we never follow their best practices. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to point out one thing on independent directors. I mean, I've been on 20 public company corporate boards, not counting any 
Berkshire or its subsidiaries. So I've, I've seen a lot of corporate boards operate. And uh, the independent directors, in many cases, are the least independent. I mean, if, if the income you receive as a corporate director, which typically may be around 250000 a year now, if that's an important part of your income, and you hope that some other corporation calls the CEO and says, how's so-and-so as a director, and they, the, the current CEO, the, your CEO says, oh, he's fine, you know, never raises any problems. Uh, and then you get on another board at 250000 and that's an important part. How in the world is that independent? I mean, it, it's, it, I really, just on observation, I, I, I can't recall particularly any independent director where their income was from the board was important to them. I can't recall them ever doing anything in board meetings or committee meetings that actually was counter to the interests. You know, they put them on the comp committee. I mean, they, they're just not going to upset the apple cart because what they're and I would, I'd probably behave the same way in the same position. I mean, if, if 250,000 a year is important to you, why in the hell would you behave in a way that's going to cause your CEO to say to the next CEO, say, this guy acts up a little bit too much. You, you know, you really better get somebody else. It's the way it works, but they've got yeah, these I think ideas. it works a little worse than Warren's telling you. <laughs> yeah, Charlie and it's I— It's really awful. It was awful. I mean, we— and only that Warren Lair, we occupy the niche for pomposity very well ourselves. We don't need any more of it. <laughs> Charlie and I were on one board. Well, I was on one board, actually, a long time ago, where uh, we owned a very significant percentage of the company. And the rest of the board was almost exclusively customers of the company, uh, but not owners. They had absolutely token holdings. And at one point, we were looking at something where a tax decision was being made in terms of a distribution of some securities. And it was a lot of money was involved. And one of the other directors said, well, let's just swallow the tax. Well, his swallowing amounted to about $15 or something. Or amount of death. <laughs> and I said, let's parse this sentence out. Let's swallow the tax. Let's let us swallow the tax. So who wants to swallow an equal amount to, <laughs> you know, to me? Uh, you don't get invited to be on boards if you belch too often at the dinner well, table. Well, Blue Chip Stamps, we had a director who said, I don't see why you guys should get be so important just because you own all the shares. Yeah. Charlie. <laughs> Charlie and I used to have to cool off after the blue chip stamps meetings because we, we, we and Rick Aaron owned what percent probably? Oh, uh, yeah, 50 percent. Yeah, 50 percent, and they'd appointed all the— it, it, They were all came, members of the Rotary Club. It came out of a government settlement or something, and, and uh, it was not an ideal form of, of, of uh, decision-making. And they just had a different calculus in their mind that we did, and, and I can understand it but I'm not going to replicate it. Yeah. While Berkshire Energy has been aggressive with its capital investments and already has some of the lowest electricity rates in the areas where it competes, it seems like the firm is winding down its annual spending at a time when more might actually be required. Are there any avenues aside from acquisitions for the company to put capital to work? Well, I'm going to throw that over to Gene in just a second, but I will tell you that <clears throat> we have th three owners of Berkshire Hathaway Energy. <clears throat> we are the 91% owner. And there are no three owners that are more interested in pouring money into sensible deals within the utility industry or are better situated in terms of the people we have to maximize any opportunities. We have never had a penny of dividends in, in whatever it is, close to 20 years of owning Mid-American Energy. And other utility companies pay high dividends. They, they, really, they just don't have the capital appetite, essentially, that that we do. So it's just a question of finding sensible projects. And, and I would say that, that there's, no, there's no group that, that is uh, as, as smart about it, as motivated about it as our group. And with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Greg. In short, we're about as good as you can get, and you should worry about something else. Yeah. 
we really hope to spend a lot of money on energy. <laughs> yeah. The couple critical areas we go forward is to look realistically in the 21, 2022 time frame, because as you've touched on, we've got a great portfolio as we finish out 19, 2019, 2020, and it's really been focused on building the renewable energy projects in Iowa, expanding the grid. But equally, we do have those opportunities in our other utilities. The footprint in Iowa realistically is getting pretty full. As we had 100% renewables, um, Warren touched on it. Every time we get a new data center, that means we can build another 300 megawatts of renewables. We'll continue to do that. <clears throat> but when you look at Pacific Corp, where we serve six states in the, in the Northwest, we've really just embarked on an expansion program there. The first part was to build significant transmission, to so expand the grid, and then start to build renewables. But just to give you some perspective of the regulation that exists in place, we started that project in 2008, and we're realistically building the first third of it. But we do have the planning in place for the second phase and the thir third phase, and that's what you'll see come into place in 2021 and 23. And the reality is we'll continue to do that in NV Energy with it really, again, the focus being on both grid expansion so we can move the resources and then supplementing it with renewables. So it's exactly what you've touched on. And we haven't identified the specific projects yet, so we never put them in our capital forecast that we disclose to, to folks. But as they firm up and we know they will go forward, uh, clearly you'll see some incremental incremental capital, and that's capital we clearly earn on behalf of the Berkshire shareholders as we, as we, uh, as we deploy it. Thank you. We will put a lot of money into energy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're really in marvelous shape in this department. Incidentally, and, and you know, Walter Scott, I mean, he, he gets excited looking at all these projects and goes out and visit them. He, he has, you know, way more about the business and, and, and he's forgotten more about it than I'll ever know. But we've, we've got a great partnership. We've got unlimited capital. We've got, uh, we'll continue to have it. And there's needs for huge capital in the industry. So I, I think 10 years from now or 20 years from now, our record will be looked at and there'll be nothing like it in, in the energy business. Uh, well, Greg, is there anybody ahead of where we are in Iowa in terms of oh. energy? <laughs> Uh, there, uh, Charlie, there, there's realistically no one ahead of us in the U.S., let alone Iowa. When you look at our, the amount of energy we produce relative to what our, what our customers consume, uh, we really lead, do lead the nation in and, Iowa. And, and are our rates about half that of our main competitor in Iowa to boot? Close. Exactly. We're right in that range. If this isn't good enough for you, I, I, we can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, I mean, we, we, sell, we sell electricity five miles from here. But, uh, Greg, is that correct? That, yeah, I mean, right across the river. Yeah, right across the river. And, you know, the wind blows the same and all of that sort of thing. And the public power district here we, all, in Nebraska, going back to George Norris, has always been a, a, a public power state. That There's, there's no... Uh, capitalism doesn't exist in the, in the electric utility field in Nebraska. So, so they have had the advantage of selling tax-exempt bonds. We have to sell taxable bonds, which raises costs to some degree. They have a big surplus, which they don't have to pay any dividends on or anything else. And our rates are cheaper than theirs, you know, basically. I mean, we, we're very proud of our utility operation. You are a big advocate of index investing of, and of not trying to time the market. But by your having Berkshire hold such a large amount of cash and T-bills, it seems to me you don't practice what you preach. I'm thinking that a good alternative would be for you to invest most of Berkshire's excess cash in a well-diversified index fund until you find an attractive acquisition or buyback stock. Had you done that over the past 15 years, all the time keeping the $20 billion cash cushion you want, I estimate that at the end of 2018, the company's $112 billion balance in cash, cash equivalents, and short-term investments in T-bills would have instead been worth about $155 billion. 
That's a perfectly decent question, and I, I wouldn't quarrel with the numbers. And I would say that that, that, that is an alternative, for example, that my successor uh, may wish to employ, because on balance, I would rather own uh, an index fund than, than, than carry Treasury bills. I would, I would say that if we'd instituted that policy in 2007 or 8, we might have been in a different position in terms of, of our ability to move uh, late in 2008 or 2009. Uh, so it, it has certain, certain execution problems with hundreds of billions of dollars than it does if you were having a similar policy with a billion or two billion or something of the sort. But it's a perfectly, it's a perfectly rational observation, and certainly looking back on 10 years uh, of a bull market, it, it, it really jumps out at you. But I would argue if you were working smaller numbers, it, it would make a lot of sense. And if you're working with large numbers, it's, it, it might well make sense in the future at Berkshire to operate that way. You know, we committed $10 billion a week ago, and there are conditions under which, and they're not, they're not remote, they're not likely in any given week or month or year, but, but there are conditions under which we could spend $100 billion very, very quickly. And if we did, if those conditions existed, it would be the capital very well deployed and much better than in an index fund. And so we've been, uh, we're operating on the basis that we will get chances to deploy capital. They will come in clumps in all likelihood, and uh, they will come when other people don't want to allocate capital. Charlie, what do you think about it? Well, I plead guilty to being a little more conservative with the cash than other people. And, but I think that's all right. Uh, we could have put all the money into a lot of securities that would have done better than the S&P with 2020 hindsight. Remember, we had all that extra cash all that period if something had come along in the way of opportunities and so on. I don't think it's a sin to be a little strong on cash when you're as big a company as we are. Uh, we don't have to. I watched Harvard use the last ounce of their cash, including all their prepaid tuition from the parents and plunge it into the market at exactly the wrong moment and make a lot of forward commitments to private equity. And they suffered like two or three years of absolute agony. We plus, don't want to be like Harvard. Plus timber and a whole bunch of things. I mean, plus timber and I mean... It, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, we're not going to change. No. <laughs> we, we, we do like having a lot of money to be able to operate very fast and very big. And it, we don't... And maybe we won't, we know we won't get those opportunities frequently. I don't think, uh, it, certainly, you know, in the next, you know, in the next 20 or 30 years, there'll be a, two or three times when it, it'll be raining gold and all you have to do is go outside. But uh, uh, we don't know when they will happen. And, and we have a lot of money to commit. And I would say that if you told me I had to either carry short-term treasury bills or have index funds and just let that money be invested in American generally, I would take the index funds. But we still have hopes. And the one thing you should very definitely understand about Berkshire is that we run the business in a way that we think is consistent with serving shareholders who have virtually all of their net worth in Berkshire. I happen to be in that position myself, but I would do it that way under any circumstances. We have a lot of people who trust us, and who, who uh, really have disproportionate amounts of Berkshire compared to their net worth uh, if you were to follow standard investment procedures. And, and uh, uh, we want to make money for everybody, but we want to make very, very sure that we don't lose permanently money from anybody, for anybody that buys our stock somewhere around intrinsic business value to begin with. We, we just have an, we have an aversion to having a million plus shareholders, maybe as many as two million, and having a lot of them ever really lose money if they're willing to stay with us for a while. And we know how people behave if, when, when the world generally is, is uh, upset. And 
they want to be with something. I think they want to be with something that they feel is like the Rock and Brawler. And and uh, we have a we have a disp we have a real disposition toward that group. Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae have new financing programs for manufactured home loans that I'm guessing could finally put purchasers of those homes who need mortgages on a somewhat more level playing field with those buying site-built homes. How positive an effect do you expect these new programs to have on manufactured home demand, and how might the programs affect Clayton's sizable profits from lending? Will, will Clayton sell more loans to Freddie and Fannie, and does that help profit even, profits even if spreads compress? Well, it may not help profits, but it, would, it, it definitely is good if the Freddie and Fannie are authorized to do more lending against manufactured homes. I mean, manufactured homes are a very reasonable way for to get people to get decent housing and have a home, and they are hard to finance to some degree. The local banks frequently do it, but the big lenders haven't wanted to do it. They are, there is the possibility or the likelihood that Freddie and Fannie are going to expand. We already, we already sell, I don't know whether it's 10 million a month of loans or something like that to Freddie and Fannie, but it would be very good for America, in my view, if Freddie and Fannie did more in that area. Uh, obviously, we would sell some more homes but we would lose financing, and we might come out behind, we might come out ahead, uh, but I think, it's, I think it would be a good thing to do. Charlie? Well, I think Freddie and Fannie will finance more and more homes, and I think they'll do more and more of it through Clayton, and they'll do it because Clayton is very trustworthy and will do a very good job at making good housing at cheap prices for people. And uh, I think Clayton will get bigger and bigger and bigger as far ahead as you can see. And the guy is young. He doesn't look like Warren and me. Not at all. We've got a terrific managerial group at, at, yeah. at Clayton. And, and we're expanding our site build homes. We just closed on uh, a builder a couple, a few days ago. And we now have nine different, I believe, nine different site built home operations. And we didn't have any a few years ago. And uh, uh, we think extraordinarily well of Kevin Clayton and his group. Our directors met last year in Knoxville and viewed the, the Clayton operation for the second time. And uh, so we like the idea of uh, Clayton expanding. And, and we like the idea of more people having very affordable housing. During, during the 2008 and 9 recession, our borrowers who had very low FICO scores on average, I mean, compared to typical home buyers, and they, if they kept their jobs, they, and they made the payments. I mean, they, they wanted that home, and the home was an enormously important item to them. And we had various programs that helped them as well. But our loan experience was far better than uh, people anticipated under the stress that existed then. But it was because a home really means something uh, to people, and uh, uh, absent, absent losing jobs or sickness, and like I say, we have some programs to help people. They, they make they make the payments, and uh, uh, they have very decent living. But they would get that even cheaper uh, if Freddie and Fannie expanded uh, their programs. And I, like I say, I hope they do. As both a major employer and a producer of consumer goods, what do you make of the uncertain outlook for good full-time jobs with the rise of automation and temporary employment? If we'd asked that question 200 years ago and somebody said, with the outlook for development of farm machinery and tractors and combines and so on, meaning that 90% of the people on farms were going to be lose their job, uh, it would look terrible, wouldn't it? But our economy and our people, our system, has been remarkably ingenious in achieving whatever we have now, 160 million jobs, 
when throughout the period, ever since 1776, we've been figuring out ways to get rid of jobs. That's what capitalism does, and it produces more and more goods per person. And we never know exactly where they're going to come from. I mean, it, it uh, you know, I don't know what, if you were, if you were, uh, whatever uh, occupation, well, if you were in the passenger train business, I mean, you know, you were going to, that was going to change. But we find ways in this economy to employ more and more people, and we've got now more people employed than ever in the history of the country, even though company after country, and company, and particularly in heavy industry and that sort of thing, has been trying to figure out naturally how to get more productive all the time, which means turning out the same number of goods with fewer people or, or turning out more goods with the same number. That's, that is capitalism. I don't, think, I don't think you need to worry about American ingenuity running out. I mean, I mean you, uh, you look at people in all kinds of, I mean, of businesses, and they like to make money, but they really like to, they like to be inventive, you know. They like they they like to do things, and uh, and this economy, it works. It will continue to work, and it will be very it's very tough uh, in certain industries, and there will be dislocations. You know, we won't be making as many horseshoes and that sort of thing when cars come along and all of that, but we do find ways now to employ whatever we're employing, 155, whatever it is, million people, and supporting a population of 330 million people. When we started with 4 million people, with 80 percent of the labor being employed on farms. So this system works and it will continue to work. And I, I don't know what the next big thing will be. <clears throat> I do know there will be a next big thing. Charlie? Well, we want to shift the scud work to the robots to the extent we can. That's what we've been doing, as Warren said, for 200 years. Nobody wants to go back to being a blacksmith or scooping along the street, picking up the horse manure or whatever the help these people used to do. Uh, we're glad to have that work eliminated. And a lot of this worry about the future comes from leftists who worry terribly that that uh, the people at the bottom of the economic pyramid have had a little stretch when the people at the top got ahead faster. That happened by accident because we were in so much trouble that we had to flood the world with money and drive interest rates down to zero. And of course that drove asset prices up and helped the rich. Nobody did that because they suddenly loved the rich. It was just an accident and it, it, it will soon pass. Uh, I, we, we want to have all this productivity improvement, and we shouldn't worry a little about the fact that one class or another is a little ahead at one stretch. Charlie, Charlie and I, we worked in a grocery store, and when people ordered a can of peas, we had ladders that we climbed up to reach the can of peas, and then we placed it in a folding box, and then we put it on a truck. And if you looked at the amount of food actually transferred between the producer and the person who consumed it and the, per and the number of people involved in the transaction, you know, it was, I don't know whether it was one-third or one-quarter or one-fifth as efficient as the way, the best way now to get food delivered to you. And the food was worse. <laughs> and, and my grandfather would, you know, was distressed about the fact that this particular credit and delivery kind of store would, would be eliminated, and it was eliminated, but society It's coming back. Pardon? It's, it's coming back. It's coming back, but more efficiently. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we've, we've seen a little creative destruction. And, and frankly, we're glad that it freed us up to go into the investment business. It worked out better for us. The Berkshire Hathaway investment portfolio holds several large financial institutions that are heavily regulated and are politically charged. Do you feel that in some cases the regulators and or politicians are running the big banks instead of the CEO and the board of directors? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but not too much. No, in insurance has been regulated. It happens to be regulated primarily on a state basis, but insurance has been regulated ever since we went into it. And it, it hasn't, 
you know, when I, when I looked at Geico, it was doing seven million of business, and we'll do 30 odd billion, a billion of business now. It, it's been regulated the whole time. And regulation can be a pain in the neck generally, but on the other hand, we don't want a bunch of charlatans operating in the insurance business. And, and insurance actually lends itself to charlatans because you get handed money and you give the other guy a promise. And I like the fact that there is regulation in the insurance business or the banking business. It doesn't mean it can't drive you crazy sometimes or anything of the sort, but those businesses should be regulated. It, uh, they're they're uh, too important, and any time you can, you can take other people's money and they go home with a promise and you go home with the money, I, I, I don't mind a certain amount of regulation in those businesses. Charlie? Yeah, well, if you're using the government's credit because you have deposit insurance, there's an implicit bargain. You can't be too crazy with what you do with the money. That's a perfectly reasonable. And I, I absolutely believe that we should have a regulation system that, that uh, involves supervision of risk taking by banks. It got particularly bad in the investment banks at the peak of the, the, the uh, real estate crisis. And the behavior was, there's only one word for the behavior. It was disgusting. And it was pretty much everybody. It's hard to think of anybody who stayed sane in that boom. They, they felt the other guys doing dumb things, I've got to do it too, or I'll be left out. What a crazy way to behave. And so, sure, there's some intervention, but it probably has to be. You want a Food and Drug Administration. Yeah. You'll, you'll be unhappy with how they do it if you're in the business and all of that, but and you know, I, I find any kind of regulation irritating, but nevertheless, it, it's good for the system. And, and actually, a number of regulators, I would, you know, I, I would say that they've really been quite sensible about regulation. But, um, you don't feel that way when you're being told how to run your business. But it, as Charlie says, you wouldn't want to be a bank that, that ran in an unregulated system where anybody could come in and do all kinds of things that would actually have, that would have consequences that drew you into their, the problems that they created themselves. And, uh, uh, we had the Wild West in banking and long ago, and it produced a lot of problems in the, in the 19th century. In Berkshire's annual shareholder letter, there's been increasingly less detail provided on its operating businesses and financial performance. For example, the company is no longer providing details on the finance and financial products segment, or a balance sheet for the manufacturing, service, and retail segment, or a breakdown of float by unit in the insurance business. For a company as large and diversified as Berkshire, why are investors being provided less information than previously? I don't think we actually provide less information. Uh, we may present it in a somewhat different form from year to year. Just uh, this year, for example, I, you know, I, I started my letter as usual in my mind as saying, "Dear Doris and Bertie, my sisters," to tell them what I would tell anybody that had a very significant proportion of their net worth in Berkshire, who was intelligent, did not know all the lingo of our various businesses that would read a lot of words because they, had, they did have a large investment. So if I explained anything and did a decent job that they would understand what I was talking about. And uh, uh, I tell them that in the language that I think will be understandable to, the, to a significant percentage of a million plus people who have all kinds of different understanding of accounting and all that sort of thing. I, I tell them, the information I would want to hear on the other side. Now, if I was a competitor and I wanted to know what one of our furniture store was, was earning or something of the sort, you know, I might love it, but it doesn't really make any difference. If you're talking about a $500 billion organization, if you understand our insurance business and in terms of giving you the picture, I think in three or four or five pages, 
you know, actually, we've got a whole bunch of stuff that required by the SEC about lost reserve development. I, I think you can write a 300-page report that gives a whole lot less information than a 50-page report, and you lose people. So I, I try to tell them, tell them, like I say, in my mind, it's my sisters. Uh, I try to tell them uh, what I would tell them if we had a private business, and they, they own a third of it each, and I own a third. And once a year, they like to get filled in, and and they don't know all, they don't know what a combined ratio means because it's a dumb term that everybody uses, and the important thing is call it a profit margin. Uh, they don't know what an, the operating ratio is in the uh, railroad business, and it's an obsolete term. It'd be better to call that a profit margin. But the lingo, we're not writing it for analysts. We are writing it. For, for shareholders, and we're trying to tell them something so they can make an addition. They can not only get the picture as to what we own now, but how we think about the operation, what we're trying to do over time. And uh, we try to do the best job we can every year. And I don't think it, I think if somebody is terribly interested in the details, they really are missing the whole picture. Because you could have known every detail of our textile business in, in 1965, but we could give you the information as how much we made from linings and how much we made from from handkerchiefs, and uh, it would it, it, you'd be in a different world. I mean, it, the important thing was how we looked at running money and what what we would do about things over time, and it just you, you could have gotten very misled if you'd written it in a, if you'd read it in 1980 or 85, and you looked for great detail on how Seas Candy was doing and as they moved eastward, you know. We'll tell you that, that, that overall that fell in terms of moving out the territory, but going into a whole lot of detail that might be very interesting to an analyst, but really for the shareholder, they've got to make a decision as to who's running their money and how they're running it and what they've done over time and what they hope to do in the future and how to measure that. And uh, we're, again, we're writing it for the individual. Charlie? Well, uh, I suppose I should be watching every tiny little business down to the last nickel, but I don't. And I don't want that much detail. And I think our competitors would like it, and it wouldn't do our shareholders any good. So we'll probably just keep reporting the way we do. You can see how flexible we are here. <laughs> China announced 12 new measures on further opening up the financial industry. All these measures will allow me more invested institutions to enter into Chinese financial market and to ensure the policies of foreign investment to be consistent with those of domestic investment. What do you think about these new measures? Do you believe the foreign financial institutions will have more pricing power over the Chinese stock markets in the future. Do you have any plans to set up a company in China? Well, we've got one now. Dairy Queen is all over China. <laughs> and it's working fine. And we didn't wait for new laws. We did it under the old laws. But we're not that big net in China, right, Warren? We're not that big what? In China. No, uh, but we, we had something, you know, that could have happened that would, would have been quite sizable. With China, it's, it's a big market, and we like big markets. I mean, we, we really can only deploy capital on a major, in a major way, maybe in 15 or so countries, or just because of the size. That but generally, I think the climate is getting better. Hmm. It yeah. really makes sense for the two countries to get along. Think of how stupid it would be if China and the United States didn't get along. Stupid on both sides, I might add. Yeah, we've, we've done well in China. We haven't done enough, but... As you've written, we hope to invest significant sums across borders. So what's your appetite to invest in the UK and Europe, and how will Brexit impact that? And while we're at it, what's your advice for solving UK's Brexit dilemma? <laughs> That's yours, Warren. <laughs> Well, I, can t I, I will tell you this. I mean, I, I, I gave an interview to the Financial Times, and I don't do that very often. 
But one of the considerations I have is that I would like to see Berkshire Hathaway better known in, in both the UK and, and Europe. And, and uh, the FT audience was an audience that, that uh, I hoped would think of Berkshire more often in terms of when businesses are for sale. Our name is familiar, I think, pretty much around the world in at least financial circles, but there's no question if anybody's going to sell a large business in the United States, they're going to think of Berkshire. They may decide for other reasons they'd rather do it differently, and, uh, but they will think of Berkshire. And uh, I don't think, I, I mean, obviously that is not as true around the world. We've had some very good luck with with a few people that have thought of Berkshire, I mean, such as the Discar, and, and, and actually Berkshire Hathaway Energy had act, uh, one of its base holdings from way back uh, was in the UK. But I was looking, in doing that interview, I was willing to spend three hours with the FT reporters uh, in the hope that, that when, they write a Ber when they write the story that somebody someplace thinks of Berkshire that wouldn't otherwise think of it. And, uh, We'd love to put more money uh, into the UK. I mean, if I get a call tomorrow and somebody uh, says, you know, I've got an X billion dollar pound a company that I think might make sense for you to own and that I would like to actually have as part of Berkshire, you know, I'll, I'll get on the plane and, and uh, be over there, but they'll have to name. They have to tell me what their price ideas are and what it's earning. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not interested in in going over and talking about it and pricing it for them, and then not making a deal. We we like to make deals when we when we actually get into action. Uh, we're hoping for it, uh, and we're hoping for a deal in the UK and in Europe, and or in Europe, uh, uh, no matter how Brexit comes out. I think it. I I don't. I'm not an Englishman, but I have the feeling it was a mistake to vote to leave. But I don't think it's, I don't think it, it doesn't, it doesn't destroy my appetite in the least for making a very large acquisition in the UK. Charlie? Well, all my ancestors came from Northern Europe, so I'm very partial to the place. On the other hand, if you ask me how to, I would vote on Brexit if I lived in Britain, I don't even know. It just strikes me as a horrible problem. And I'm glad it's theirs, not mine. But if I called you tomorrow and said we had a deal in UK, you'd, you'd tell me oh, to I, I, I would go in in a minute. Yeah. yeah. Those, are my kind, those are my kind of people. I understand them. Yeah. It seems like you've gone from a model that was originally focused on putting boots on the ground to find investment and acquisition opportunities to one where you, you're seemingly more content to have sellers or the representatives call you or drop by the office, basically more of a pool model than a push model. There's nothing wrong with this, but I just wonder if the opportunity cost that comes with this type of model is that Berkshire misses out on a lot of overseas business where owners are unaware of your willingness to step up and buy them outright and allow them to run their companies under the Berkshire umbrella and missing stocks investment opportunities because Berkshire is not necessarily familiar enough with the local market. At this point, do you think Berkshire would benefit from putting more boots on the ground in these overseas markets? Actually, it must have been after we bought his car, Aton Wertheimer um, convinced me that, that we should get more exposure in Europe. And he, and he, and he, and he helped out in doing that. I, I went over, he arranged uh, various meetings. Uh, we've had a lot of contact. It isn't that they're not a, they're not aware, uh, and we do hear about some, but we do have the problem. They got to be sizable. I mean, it, if we do a a billion dollar acquisition and it makes a hundred million dollars or thereabouts pre-tax, eighty million dollars after tax. You know, if we really know the business and we're sure we're not going to have a problem with the people running it being being motivated in the future and doing a similar job as to when they had their own money and everything, it's nice to to add 80 million to 25 billion, but it, you can't afford to spend lots of time doing that. And we've 
gain something by having Todd and Ted uh, do some looking at things, screening them and all that sort of thing. But in the end, you want somebody that, some family that's held, held their business in Europe or in the UK for 50 or 100 years that can make a deal and that, and that wants to do it uh, with Berkshire. I mean, if they're, if they're looking for, to get the most money, if they want to have an auction, we're not going to win and we're not going to participate because we're not going to waste our time on it. Uh, it it's, uh, if we form a acquisition crew, they'll acquire something. I mean, I, I've, I've watched so many institutions in operation that, uh, uh, you know, if, you're, if your job every day is to go to work and screen a bunch of things with the idea that you're the strategic department or acquisition department, you're going to want to do something. I, I want to do something, but I don't want to do something unless Berkshire benefits by it and clearly benefits by it, and it's generally it's of a size. Warren, our problem is not, not a lack of boots on the ground. Our problem is the people on the ground are paying prices that we don't want to pay. Yeah. That's our problem. We can, we can, and that problem is not going to be cured by boots. We can spend $100 billion in the next year. That is not a problem. No. Spending it intelligently is a huge problem. The our, our competitors are buying with somebody else's money, and they get part of the upside and take none of the downside. And the that is hard up. to compete with people like that. Yeah. They'll leverage it up. They'll make a lot of money if it fails, and they'll make even more money if it succeeds. And uh, that's, not our, that's not our equation. No. So, uh, and that, has, that isn't always that way, but it's, it's certainly that way now. It's probably— uh, It's not in the shareholders' interest that we get to be like everybody else. Oh, yeah. In studying the most significant value creators of all time, it is very evident that the major compounding effect happened later at the later stages of the careers, or in Vanderbilt's case, even beyond his own career. So your recent investments have suggested to me that you are designing Berkshire to being a steady compounding machine that should continue to create value for a very long time. Would you both please elaborate on this compounding machine and the machine's ability to continue to adapt to keep this value creation durable? Uh, and then is this legacy one of your sort of primary motivations when you wake up every day? I would say it's the, it is the primary motivation, but it's been that for a very, very, very long time. No matter what was going right in my life, if things were going badly at Berkshire, I, I, I would not feel good. You know, and, uh, I don't need to be spending my time working on something that, that makes me feel bad about the results of, you know, when we get through. So I, and it's, it's, it's something that's doable. I mean, the culture is stronger now than it was 10 years ago, and it was stronger then than 10 years previously. It moves slowly, but it goes in the right direction. And when we get chances to deploy the capital, we've, we've always tried to make any entity, whether it was the partnership originally or the or Berkshire <coughs> now or blue chip stamps when we owned it or, or even diversified retail, we, we wanted them all to be compounding in effect be compounding machines. That's why people gave us capital. That's why we put our own capital in. And if we failed at it, we, feel like we really felt like we'd failed. It didn't make any difference how much money we made from fees or anything like that. We, we, we knew what our yardstick was. And, and so that, that will continue. I think Berkshire is better situated than it's ever been, except for the fact that size is a drag on performance. And I, I probably wrote that 40 years ago. I wrote it actually when I closed the partnership to new money when we had like $40 million in it. I just said that additional capital would drag down returns from a $40 million base. So you can imagine how I feel with a $368 billion base of capital in Berkshire now. But this culture is special. It can work. It won't be the highest compounder by a long shot against many other businesses. I think it won't be, it'll be one of the safest ways to make decent money over time, but uh, that will depend on the people that follow us. Charlie? Well, we came a long way from very small beginnings, and the fact that it slows down a little when it becomes monstrous is not my idea of a huge tragedy. I, and I think we will continue to do very well in the future. We had nothing like 
the energy operation, you know, 20 years ago, and it's a powerhouse. We had nothing like Kevin's operation in home building 30 years ago, and it will soon be the biggest. Well, even now, it's bigger than anybody else in the country. You got both types of high housing, isn't it? Houses? I think so. And we have a lot going for us, and I'm satisfied. I think it's going to continue reasonably. And it would ruin our life if we did it terribly. <laughs> so that, that's what we wake up thinking about in the morning. But uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be in a business where I was going to let down other people. And I think you'd be crazy to do something like that, even if you weren't rich in 88. <laughs> so, but we are motivated to have something that, that is regarded as, as something different than others. And, and, and we're actually in a world where so much money is institutionalized. You know, uh, I, I like the idea of having something that's actually owned by individuals in in very significant part, who basically trust us and, and uh, you know, don't worry about what the next quarter's earnings are going to be. I, I, think it, I think it's different than much of capitalism, and I think it's a, something that Charlie and I feel good about. There's no Charlie? Yeah, absolutely. Over a 10-year period, Berkshire's growth in intrinsic value would outperform the S&P 500. If you agree, could you estimate by how many percentage points? <laughs> well, the answer is I won't estimate anything. But if we just own stocks and we own the S&P, our performance would be significantly worse than the S&P because we would be incurring a corporate tax, which would now be 21 percent on capital gains, plus possibly some state income taxes, and effectively our tax rate on dividends is, is depends where they're held, but, uh, somewhere between 10 and a half or, or 11 and 13 percent. So Berkshire is a mistake, uh, or it's, a, it's at a corporate disadvantage simply by the way the tax law runs compared to owning an index fund, which has no tax at the corporate level, but, but uh, just passes through uh, to shareholders. So, I don't, uh, I don't know whether we'll, we'll outperform the S&P 500 or not. I know that we'll behave with our shareholders' money exactly as we would behave with our own money. And we will have, we'll basically tie our, our fortunes in life to, to this business, and we will be very cognizant of doing anything that can destroy value in any significant way, but we will probably uh, if, if there were to be a, a very strong bull market from this point forward, or we would probably underperform during that period. If uh, the market five years from now or ten years from now is, is at this level or below, we will probably overperform. But I, I, I don't quite understand the question in terms of uh, when it says the total return of the S&P over a ten-year period and Berkshire's growth in intrinsic value would outperform. I, I don't know whether that will happen or not, Charlie. Well, there'd be one big advantage for the shareholders that pay taxes, and that is that uh, the, the Berkshire shareholders, even if we just match the S&P, we'd be way ahead after taxes. We all have a pretty decent role in life and a pretty good position. We shouldn't be too disappointed. No. If we, we could have structured going back to partnership days, we could have structured things so that actually, over a period of time, doing the same things we did uh, would, have would, would have come out somewhat more favorably for shareholders if we kept it to the original partnership group. But, but the, the present form hasn't worked badly, although we have in, had periods when our corporate capital gains tax, as opposed to the individual, uh, I think it got up to 39 uh, percent a couple of years or one year, and certainly was 35 percent for a long time. And then on top of that, we had uh, state income taxes in some cases, and they exceeded uh, 
well, I mean, if you owned a pass-through fund, you, you, you did not have that level of possible double taxation. Now, if you hold your stock forever, you don't pay it. But if you actually sell your stock, you've had a double tax effect. We're not complaining in any way, shape, or form. This country has treated us incredibly well. And we've added this huge tailwind, which I wrote about in the annual report, and it wouldn't have happened in any other country. So uh, it's, uh, we, we've been very lucky that, that we've been operating in this country at this time. Uh, in Nevada, several casinos have cut the cord with our NV Energy subsidiary and are seeking their electricity needs elsewhere, even though they had to pay huge exit fees. And do you believe that these are rational choices or were they made for non-economic reasons? Two, what can NVD do, if anything, to stem the tide of defections? And three, is this something that could happen in other states where you operate regulated utilities? It's a question for Greg. <laughs> <laughs> We've owned the utility there for approximately five years. Um, when we inherited the utility, we knew it had some fundamental issues around its customers. The relationships were really strained from day one because they'd had a history of continuing to increase rates, and they really weren't uh, delivering renewable energy or, or, or meeting the customers' needs or expectations. So we, we knew we had some challenges there. As we sit here today, uh, we've had five customers leave our system. Those customers still use our distribution services. So the only thing we do not provide them is the power. So we have lost an opportunity to sell them power, and we've lost the associated margin on that. Um, and we're disappointed with that. Uh, we do recover you know, substantial fees, as you, as you noted. How the commission looked at it was, well, you'll lose this customer. We'll give you effectively six years of profit on that. And by then, you should have grown back into um, your normal load. And actually, it's a fair outcome. Our load is higher than it was relative to when those customers have left. So we've grown through that, and it's consistent with their, their belief. The fundamental issue, and you've touched on it, why are they leaving? Um, there are economic reasons for them leaving. And the fundamental reason is, in year seven, they no longer bear sort of the societal costs that are being imposed by the state. They don't have to bear the cost of renewable energy. They don't bear the cost of energy efficiency. And they viewed it as sort of the time to exit out of that model. Uh, we do have a variety of legislation that's going to levelize the playing field. We've had a number of customers that announced they were leaving now have entered into long-term agreements with NV Energy. And I really do believe our team has the right model, which we're much more focused on delivering a great value proposition to our customers. So it has to include price, but equally we're building substantial renewable energy there now. And uh, long term, our team will, will, will deliver a great proposition to them. And I think that um, and NV Energy, will, it, it will prosper in the long term. We're going to be happy with it as a long term investment. Greg, could you have um, Could you? Uh, Give them, give the audience a, uh, a rough approximation of what, say, in the 10 years or whatever it may be before we bought Nevada Power, what had happened with rates, what has happened with rates under us, and what has happened with coal generation uh, under us. Right. Warren's really expanding on what we are, the focus we've brought to delivering something to the customer. So if you'd looked at the prior 10 years, they pretty much had a rate strategy that every second year, their rates would go up sort of by the cost of inflation. And that pretty much materialized uh, year after year. We came in immediately, just like we've done in Iowa. So we've built all that renewable in Iowa, and we've never increased rates since the date we acquired it, 1999. So rates have been stable, and we don't ever see raising rates in Iowa till probably 2030 or 2031. Uh, our team took a very similar approach in, in Nevada, which was to you know, stabilize it. Uh, so rates are, are down probably 5 to 7% since we've owned them, so we haven't had rate increases. We've announced substantial rate increases again that'll take effect every two years. So just like we used to be able to have rate increases, we have a, a view of when we'll decrease their rates. The rates will go down again in, uh, in 2002. We've, uh, and, and or I mean, uh, in two years. Uh, and then on top of that, there's been an approach to 
uh, eliminate coal, as, as Warren touched on. So fundamentally, when we acquired it, all their coal fleet was operating. We've retired a substantial portion of the coal fleet already. And by, I, I believe it's within a year of this, 2023, we'll have eliminated 100% of their use of coal in that state. And it was a substantial portion of their portfolio in the past. For, uh, Todd and Ted, if possible. Um, so according to Warren, um, you lagged slightly behind the S&P 500 since joining uh, Berkshire. So uh, what recent changes, if any, have you implemented to uh, increase your odds of beating the S&P in your respective stock portfolios over the next 10 years? I'm not sure whether Todd or Ted are here, but they... Uh, I will tell you, but then I'll make this the final report on it. But on March 31st, actually, one is modestly ahead, one is modestly behind. But they are extraordinary managers. It has not been. It, it was a tough. It's been a tough period to beat the S and B. And like I say, one one is now uh, is ahead of the S and B over that period. One's modestly behind. They've also helped us in, in just all kinds of ways. What, what, what Todd has done in connection with the medical initiative we have uh, with J.P. Morgan and Amazon, I mean, uh, I don't know how many hours a week he's worked totally on that. that the things they brought to me, what, what Ted did in, in terms of the home capital group, uh, where we have essentially, uh, in a major way, what well, we stabilized a financial institution that was under attack and experiencing runs in Canada, and he did the whole thing. I, uh, I heard about that on a Monday, and on Wednesday we put an offer before the company, and, and pr previously to that they probably had dozens and dozens of people combing over them, and, and meanwhile they were struggling, and, and uh, you know, it was remarkable what he did, and, and, and I think it's appreciated uh, in the Toronto area. So. Um, we are enormously better off because the two are with us. And while we have that measurement, like I say, I'd, I'll just put it this way, they're doing better than I am anyway. So if you ask me to report on them all the time, I'll have to report on myself all the time. And I'm not, <laughs> that would be embarrassing compared to how they do. They do very, they're very, very smart. They've been smart with their own money over, over the years. They've been smart in running other people's money over the years. And they've made us a lot of money, but they made it during a market where you'd have made a lot of money in the S&P as well. Do you think that Amex's share of mind is enough to win the credit cards race? How do you see Amex's competitive position now compared to the past, and who is the most threatening competitor now compared to the past? Yeah, everybody's a competitor, and including now Apple that has just instituted a, a uh, card, I guess, in conjunction with uh, Goldman Sachs. Everybody, there, there will always be, in my view, many, many competitors in the business. Banks can't afford to leave the field. It's a growing field. They build up receivables on it. But I wouldn't think of the credit card business as a one-model business any more than I would think of the car business uh, as essentially being one model. I mean, Ferrari is going to make a lot of money, but they're going to have just a portion of the market. Well, Amex, Amex is growing around the world with individuals, is growing around the world with small businesses. Uh, you just saw the contract they made with Delva, which is probably the ideal partner that runs, uh, what, for eight or nine, whatever it may be, nine or ten years, actually. Uh, it's, you know, the buildings go up per capita, they go up, they, the, the coverage spreads, uh, and they're going to have loads of competition, uh, and they always will, uh, but they had, uh, you know, that, that's something uh, J.P. Morgan, you know, took on the Platinum card and the, was a competitor, and the Platinum card had uh, highest renewal rates that they had, and they increased the price, I think, from 450 to $550 during a competitive battle. And retention improved, and new business improved, and 68 percent or so of the new business was was millennials. I mean, it is not an identical product. 
with anything else. And, and as a premium card, it has a clientele which is large. It may only be X percent of the market, maybe three quarters of X percent or whatever it may be. It isn't, it isn't for the person that likes to have five cards and look every day at which one provides the most rewards that day or in what gas stations or something of the sort. But it's got a very large constituency that has a, a renewal rate, a usage rate that's the envy of everybody else in the industry. So I'm, I, uh, I like our American Express position uh, very well, Charlie. Charlie, anything on American no. Express? No, I, I, <laughs> I think we own the world as long as the technology stays the same. Now we, it's an interesting thing. This I have year, no opinion about technology. This year, the technology is not, is not the whole thing. I mean, you know, it, it, uh, fortunately, I mean, it, uh, uh, if you look at credit card usage, uh, there are a lot of different things motivating different people to use different various types of payment systems. And there's a lot of them that are growing. There's some of them that are, that are marginal. And, and American Express is an extraordinary operation. And I think this year, our share of the earnings, well, by next year, our share of the earnings of American Express will be equal to the cost of our position. We'll be earning 100% on what that position cost us, and I think it will grow. But, uh, and I think the number of shares will go down and our interest will go up without us playing out a dime. So it's, it's a... As you say, we own the world if it doesn't change. Well, even if it changes something. The world has changed a lot. American Express was formed in 1850. No, I'm talking about WeChat. Well, you, can talk about, you can talk about all kinds of competitors. But, yeah. <laughs> but the... American Express actually was an express company formed in 1850, like you say, by Wells and Fargo, of all people. And, uh, uh, you know, for a while they carried these big trunks around of valuables, and, and then the railroads came along, and that wasn't going to work very well anymore, so they went to the traveler's checks. And, and it's a very interesting thing. In 1950, when I was living at 116th and Broadway, they were down at 65 Broadway. And they were the most important name in travel. They were synonymous with the integrity of their traveler's checks. And the whole company, in a record year for travel, earned $3 million. $3 million, what, what a bond trader earns now in my lifetime. That's what they've done with, and they, their hand going in was the traveler's check, which has more or less disappeared. But the power of that brand intelligently used going into the credit card business, where they entered much later than the Diners Club, later than carte blanche, but they came to dominate the luxury end of the, the credit card business. It's, it's a fantastic story, and, and uh, I'm glad we own 18% of it. Berkshire is committed to providing $10 billion of financing in the, in the form of an 8% preferred share and attached warrants for Occidental's proposed acquisition of Anadarko. This is the first time Berkshire has committed to such a large preferred share investment since the acquisition of Heinz in 2013. What did you find attractive about the Occidental deal in terms of its business, and should we expect other large financing transactions in the future? I don't think the Occidental transaction will be the last one we do. <laughs> there may be one, you know, in a month there may be not. There may be one three or four years from now. It won't be identical. I hope it's larger, but. The point is, we, <clears throat> we're very likely to get the call because we can do something that really, <clears throat> I don't think, no institution can do it. I mean, they've got committees that have to pass on it, and they want to have so-called MAC clauses, material adverse changes. They want to do this and that. And uh, uh, if somebody wants a lot of certain money for a deal, uh, you know, they've seen that I can get a call on Friday afternoon, and, on, and they can make a date with me on Saturday, and on S Sunday it's done. And uh, they absolutely know that they have $10 billion, and we're not going to tell them how to structure or their transaction or do anything else. They, they've got it. And there will be times 
uh, in the future when something not identical but similar comes along and and we're the one to call and I hope it's larger than 10 billion. It could be, it could be we'll do, you know, in the next five years, it could be we'll do a lot of money, additional money and things similar to this, not identical. And it could be that nothing will happen, but, but if there are any $10 billion or $20 billion or maybe even $50 billion two-day transactions that are in the world, believe me, they'll think of Berkshire Hathaway for sure in terms of what number to call. Try. Well, I like it. <laughs> I called Charlie as soon as we made the day. I called Ron Olson first because I was worried that he might have a conflict. Uh, uh, and in about 10 minutes he had, I told him we, it had to be done by Monday night. And Cravath was being told the same thing uh, by Occidental. And it was very light on on Monday night, but but all the papers were put in order, and Munger Tolls was in Los Angeles, and Corbath was in New York, and I was in Omaha, and I didn't do that much. Mark Hamburg did a lot, a lot of the work. He was at work on Sunday on other things when I went down to, to uh, meet with the Occidental people, and uh, it it was the product of of people who understood us, understood how we operate, both with an incentive to, to put all the manpower on, on necessary on, 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 on the job. And like I say, they're, they're, I think their board of directors met at 10 o'clock on Monday night to approve it, but they could announce it Tuesday morning and that's what they wanted to do. And, and with Berkshire, they could do it. My question is about your discipline risk evaluation approach and how you balance that with the fact that perseverance and determination and grit are often necessary for, su for success. I certainly like determination and grit in the, uh, in the, with the people we work for, but we, we don't have any formula that evaluates risk, but we certainly make a, our own calculation of risk versus reward in every transaction we do. And uh, that's true whether it's marketable securities, that's true whether it's private investments, that's true whether it's making an investment in a business. And sometimes we're wrong, and we're going to be wrong sometimes in the future. You can't make a lot of decisions in this business without being wrong. But we don't think the procedure or the results would be changed favorably by having lots of committees and lots of spreadsheets and that sort of thing. If I had a group under me, they would try and figure out what I wanted the answer to be, and they would tell me what I wanted to hear. And I've watched that approach at, at 20 public companies. And, and uh, what the CEO wants to do, they, they may spend a lot of time getting there, but, uh, but the investment banker gets there and the internal uh, committees get there or the internal operations get there. The calculations are... It's the same as the insurance business with a G. A G gets calls on insurance deals, and you have to think through that deal. The main thing is, yeah, are you reasonably sure that you know what you're doing? And uh, uh, if it gets past that hurdle, then we go on to figure out the math of, of uh, gain versus loss and how much loss we can afford to take in anything. And we're willing to take what sound like large losses if we think that the rewards are are more likely and, and proportional. Yeah, it's very disappointing. We have no formulas around Berkshire. We, we, don't, we don't sit down and, and write a bunch, you know, uh, have people work till midnight calculating things and putting, putting spreadsheets together. And, and if the hurdle rate is 15% or something, having them all come out at 15.1 or 15.2, because that's what's going to happen. I mean, it's, you're going you're to get the numbers you want to hear to an extreme degree. Uh, uh, the, the proposals we receive from the investment world, I've got to tell you about one because it, it illustrates go, go on. We, we received a proposition the other day, and I'll disguise the numbers a little bit so nobody uh, can pick it out. But it was a private company, and we'll say it was earning $100 million a year. 
but the seller of the business and the investment banker suggested that we should look at the earnings as being $110 million a year because as a private company, they had to pay their top people in cash, which was expensed, but we could pay them in stock options and things like that, which weren't expensed or were explained as not really counting, and therefore we would, could report $110 million if we gave away something we didn't want to give away. But by essentially by, by sort of lying about our accounting, we could add $10 million to their earning, and they wanted us to pay them because they couldn't do it, and we could do it, and therefore, at this point, they're losing me, of course, <laughs> totally. But it, it's just astounding, the, the accounting games that are played. All the adjustments are why the place should really be, will be earning more than before. It's, it's, it's a business. We also had one that came in from a private equity firm, and by a mistake, uh, we got the email that was sent to the manager from the email from the private equity firms that owned it to the manager in terms of making projections for it. And they told them to add 15 percent because they say Buffett will discount it by 15 percent or 20 percent anyway. So just just add 15 percent to offset his conservatism. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's not an elegant business, as Charlie will tell you. <laughs> you have any better stories, Charlie? <laughs> it's bad enough. <laughs> Thank you, Warren. I think why do we want our leading citizens lying and cheating? Andrew. Uh, Elon Musk says that Tesla will start to offer insurance for its cars and can price it better than a typical insurance company because of the data it collects from all the vehicles on the road. What about the threat to Geico of automobile companies themselves getting into the insurance business? And on a very similar topic, Tesla recently announced that they're shifting to an online-only sales model. What does this portend for Berkshire Hathaway Automotive? Actually, General Motors had a company for a long time called Motors Insurance Company, and, and various companies have tried it. I would say that uh, uh, the success of the auto companies getting into the insurance business are probably about as likely as the success of the insurance companies getting into the auto business. Uh, it, it, I worry much more about progressive than all of the auto company possibilities that I could see in terms of getting an insurance business. It's, it's not an easy business uh, at all. And uh, I would bet against any company in the auto business being any kind of, a, out, uh, of an unusual success. The idea of using telematics in terms of studying, people, studying people's driver's habits, that's, that's spreading quite, quite widely. It is important to have data on how people drive, how hard they brake, how much they swerve, all kinds of things. Uh, so I don't doubt the value of the data, but I don't think that the, the auto companies will have any, any advantage to that. I don't think they'll make money in the insurance business. The, uh, using the Internet to shop for cars is like you know, using the Internet for shopping for everything. It's another competitor. And uh, uh, there's no question that people will look for better ways. Now, the gross margin on new cars, on new cars is about 6% or thereabout. So there's, there's, there's not lots of room in the game, but, but that's, that will be a method and that will sell some cars. And that there are, you know, it, it, it's, it's another competitor. But, uh, but I don't think it, it destroys the auto dealer who takes good care of the customers and is, is there to service the customers. And no, uh, it, it, it's not a, it's not an overwhelming threat, but it's obviously something that's going to be around and will sell some cars. A lot of Berkshire's success over the years has come from the fact that you and Charlie have had the luxury of being patient, waiting for the right opportunities to come along to put excess capital work, even if it has led to a buildup of large amounts of cash on the balance sheet. This has historically worked out well for shareholders as you and Charlie have been able to take full advantage of the disruptions in equity and credit markets or special situations like we saw with the Oxy deal to negotiate deals on terms that ultimately benefit Berkshire shareholders. That said, there is an opportunity cost attached to your decision to hold on to so much cash, one that investors have been willing to bear, primarily by foregoing a return of excess capital as dividends and share purchases, as well as seeing lower returns on cash holdings. As we look forward, how certain can we be that this will still be the case once you're no longer running the show, especially if Berkshire's returns are expected to be lower over time, 
And is it not more likely that the next managers of Berkshire will have to manage the eventual migration of Berkshire from an acquisition and investment platform to a returning capital to shareholders' vehicle? Well, that's certainly a possibility. I mean, that's a possibility under me. It's a possibility under the successor. I mean, it's a question of can you invest truly large sums reasonably well. You can't do it as well as you can do small sums, so there's no question about that. But uh, uh, we will have to see how that works out over many years, because certain years, lots of opportunities, huge opportunities present themselves, and, and other years are, are totally dry holes. So that's not a judgment you can make in a one-year period or a three-year period. It's certainly a judgment you can make over time, though. And, and I personally, my estate will will uh, have basically nothing but Berkshire in it uh, for some time as it gets to dispersed to philanthropies. And I'm, I have a section in there which says uh, to the trustees, in effect, who manage it, I, I, have, a tr I have a section in there that says, uh, ignore the, uh, you're, or you're, you're, you're exempt, to, from my standpoint, uh, from the law that Trustees normally should diversify and do all of that sort of thing. And I, I want the entire amount that they have to be kept in Berkshire as they distribute it over time to the philanthropies. And I don't worry at all about the fact. I, I would like to have a very large sum go to the philanthropies. And I, I don't worry at all about the fact that it essentially will all be in Berkshire. I'm willing to make that decision while I'm alive, which will continue for some years after I die. So I have a lot of confidence in the ability of the Berkshire culture to endure and that we have the right people to make sure that that happens. But I'm betting my entire net worth on that, and that doesn't give me pause at all. I rewrite my will every few years, and I write it, I write it the same way in respect to the Berkshire Holdings. Charlie? Oh, I don't know what the index is. And I have always been willing to be, own just two or three stocks. And I have not minded that everybody who teaches finance in uh, law school and business school teaches that what I'm doing is wrong. It isn't wrong. It's worked beautifully. Uh, I don't think you need a portfolio of 50 stocks if you know what you're doing. And I hope my heirs will just sit. My heirs hope that I'll change my will. <laughs> <laughs> How do you deal with conflicts when they arise between the two of you? Are you applying personal conflicts in terms of doing something ourselves versus having Berkshire do it? Or, or uh, oh, between the two of you, I'm just... Uh, uh, Charlie and I, literally, and people find this hard to believe, but in 60 years, we've never had an argument. We have disagreed about things, and we'll probably keep occasionally disagreeing about this or that. But if you define an argument as something where emotion starts entering into it, or uh, uh, anger, or anything of the sort, it just doesn't. It doesn't happen. I, I think that. Uh, Charlie is smarter than I am, but I also think that there are certain things where I've spent more time on them than he has, and, and sometimes we both think we're right, and generally I get my way because Charlie is willing to do it that way, and he's never second-guessed me when things have been wrong, and I wouldn't dream of second-guessing him if he were doing something that was wrong, so it turned out to be wrong. It, we, we, we will we'll never have a conflict, basically. Charlie? Well, the issue isn't how long how we get along. The issue is how is it going to work when we're gone? And the answer is fine. It's going to work fine. Yeah. Yeah. We're lucky that, you know, I ran into him when I was, what, 28 years old. And I, and I both worked in the same grocery, grocery store and they grew up less than a block away from where I now live and everything, but I did not know who Charlie Munger was until I was 28. But, uh, but clearly we're in, in sync in how we see the world, and we're in sync on business decisions, basically. Charlie would do fewer things than I would, but that's because I'm spending my time on this while he's designing dormitories or something. And we both, we both keep busy in our own ways, and we have a lot of fun 
uh, dividing the labor like we do. You really want to work. I mean, having the right partners in life, particularly the right spouse, but particularly having the right partners in life is enormously important. I mean, it just, it's, it's more fun with a partner, both in personal life and, and, and in business life, and, and you probably get more accomplished too, but you just have a better time. It would not be any fun to to work in a little room and make a ton of money trading around securities, but never, never working with another human being. So at, uh, I recommend finding, well, Charlie gave some advice in the movie, finding the well, best, uh, best person will have you or something like that. It, yeah. uh, <laughs> sort of a limited objective. Uh, but it's I, not hard to be happy if you're a collector and don't run out of money. Collecting is intrinsically fun. Just think, who, how many people who you know in your whole life who were collectors who didn't run out of money, who weren't happy collecting? That's what we've been collecting all our lives. You know, it's a very interesting thing. There's always a new rock to be turned over, and it's interesting. Yeah, and certainly we've collected friends that make our lives better and that we have a good time with. and. Uh, it's, it's very important, you know, the who you select as your heroes or your friends, and, and uh, I've, I've been lucky in this. I mean, it was only because of a doctor named Eddie Davis and his wife that Charlie and I even met. And, but if you, if you keep doing enough things, some will work out very lucky, and, and uh, the best ones are ones that involve lifelong involvement with, with other people. But, uh, and, uh, We've got some in our, some of our directors, a number of our directors that have had similar impacts on me. So I, uh, I recommend that uh, you look for somebody better than you are and then try to be like they are. It's funny, you know, we've lost people along the way. And when I lost Warren's secretary, I thought, my God, she was so wonderful, Gladys. We'll never get another one. Becky is better. <laughs> and then we... We had Vern McKenzie, who was a wonderful chief financial officer. He's gone, and, and the incurrent incumbent is better. We've been very lucky, and maybe the shareholders will be lucky a few more times. Our world is changing at a faster pace today versus 40 years ago, and even more so going forward. Under this context, for each of us individually, shall we expand our circle of competence continuously over time, or shall we stick with the existing circle but risk having a shrinking investment universe? Obviously, you should, under any conditions, you should expand your circle of competence. If you can. If you can. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, uh, I've expanded mine a little bit over time. If but you can't, you ought to be pretty cautious. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 you can't force it. You know, it, if you told me that I had to, you know, become an expert on on physics or, you know. Dance may be the lead in the ballet, Warren. That would be a sight. Yeah, well, that's what it hadn't even occurred. Now. That's one you may be thinking about, but I, <laughs> that didn't even occur to me. But, no, it, it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean you can't expand it at all. I mean, I... I I did learn about some things as I've gone along in, in, a, in a few businesses. In some cases, I've learned that, we're, that I'm incompetent, which is actually a plus, and you've discarded that one. Uh, but it doesn't really have, the world is going to change. It's going to keep changing. It's changing every day, and that, that, that makes it interesting. You know, it, uh, as it changes, certainly within what you think is your present existing circle, you, have to, you should be the master of figuring that one out, or, or it really isn't your circle of competence. And, if you get a chance to expand it somewhat as you go along. I've learned some about the energy business from Walter and, and Greg as, as we work together, but I'm not close to their level of competence on it. But I, I do know more than I used to know. And so you get a chance to expand it a bit. Usually, I would, I would think normally your core competence is probably something that sort of fits the way the mind has worked. Some people have what I call a money mind, and they, they will work well in certain types of money situations. Uh, it isn't so much a question of IQ. The mind is a very strange thing. But, uh, and 
people have specialties, whether in chess or bridge, I see it in different person, people that can do impossible, what seem to be impossible things. And they're really kind of, as Charlie would say, stupid in other areas. <laughs> so uh, just keep working on it. Don't, don't think you have to increase it and therefore start bending the rules. You've said that you could return 50% per annum if you were managing a $1 million portfolio. What type of strategy would you use? Would you invest in cigar butts, i.e. average businesses at very cheap prices, or would it be some type of arbitrage strategy? It might well be the arbitrage strategy, but in a very different, perhaps, way than, than customary arbitrage is thought of. But one way or another, I can assure you, if Charlie was working with a million or I was working with a million, we would find a way to make that with, with essentially uh, no risk, not using a lot of leverage or anything of the sort. But you change the one million to a hundred million, and that 50 goes down like a, like a rock. That, uh, uh, there are little fringe inefficiencies that people don't, don't spot. And you do get opportunities occasionally to do, but, but they don't really have any applicability to Berkshire. So, Charlie? Well, I agree totally. It's just what you used to say that large amounts of money, they develop their own anchors. Yeah. You just, it's, it gets harder and harder. I've just seen genius after genius with a great record, and pretty soon they got 30 billion and two floors of young men and away goes the good record. It's just the way it works. But Charlie, it's hard as the money goes up. When Charlie was a lawyer, and initially, I mean, you were developing a couple of real estate projects. Or, I mean, you find, if you really want to make a million dollars, or 50% on a million, and you're willing to work at it, and that's doable, but it just has no applicability to managing huge sums. But, uh, I wish it did, but it doesn't. Yeah, Lee Lu, using nothing but the float on his student loans, had a million dollars practically shortly after he graduated as a total scholarship student. He, he found just a few things to do yeah. and did them. I've been looking at CIS candies, and I am a pretty good fan of them. And I see Charlie's as well through our meeting. Um, and even with all our consumption, and you know, the company has given us generous profits over the past decades. What do you think the company has not grown to the scale of Mars or Hershey's? Well, we've probably had a dozen or so ideas over the years, and we used to really focus on it because it was much small, a much more sizable part of our business. In fact, it was practically our only business aside from insurance. And uh, like I say, we've had 10 or 12 ideas. Some of them we've tried more than once, and as we've had a new manager, they've tried them, and, and the truth is none of them really work. And uh, uh, the business is extraordinarily good in a very small niche. Box chocolates are something that everybody likes to receive or maybe give as a gift, both sides of it, and relatively few of the people uh, go out and buy to consume themselves. Uh, if, if I leave a box of chocolates open at the office, we've only got 25 people, but it's gone, you know, almost immediately. If I take it as a gift to somebody, they're happy to get it. But, uh, and, and if you leave the box open at a dinner party, again, they're all gone. But those same people that so readily grab it when it's right there in front of them do not walk out to a candy store very often. And, and buy it just to eat themselves. They're not going to buy it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very much a gift product. It does not grow worldwide. Very interesting thing. People in, at least the last time I checked, people in the West prefer dark, milk chocolate. People in the East prefer dark chocolate. People in the West like big, chunky pieces. People in the East will take miniatures. And, and it's, we, we've tried to move it geographically many, 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 many times, because it would be so wonderful if it, when it works, it works wonderfully. And, but it, it, it doesn't travel that well. We, if we open a store in the east, we get enormous traffic for a while, and everybody says, we've been waiting for you to come, and then it finally, we end up 
with a store that does X pounds per year when we need one and a half X uh, in the same square footage to make terrific returns. And, and uh, we, we've tried everything because the, the math is so good when it works. And overall, we have a business that doesn't, doesn't grow. Chocolate consumption generally doesn't, doesn't grow that much, but yeah, obviously. Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, well, we fail in turning our little candy company into Mars or Hershey's for the same reason that you failed to get the Nobel Prize in physics and achieve immortality. <laughs> it's too tough for us. But we put $25 million into it, and it's given us over $2 billion of pre-tax income, well over $2 billion, and we've used it to buy other businesses. If we were the typical company and had bought that business and tried desperately to make use all the retained earnings within the candy business, I think we'd have fallen on our face. I think that it, it just illustrates that all these formulas, you, you know, you learn or that, that you know, having a strategic plan to use all the capital. Some businesses work in a fairly limited area. Others really play out over. This Dr. Pepper, you know, has a, I don't know what the, what the percentage is now, but it might be a 10 or 12% market share or something like that in, in Dallas, or maybe it's eight, but and then you go to Detroit or Boston, and it's, it's, it's less than 1%. I'm not sure about the numbers currently, but, but you'd think in a mobile society, you know, with Dr. Pepper having been around since the time Coke was founded in 1886, uh, it, it's amazing how certain things travel, certain things don't travel. At, uh, you know, the candy bars, you mentioned uh, Hershey. I mean, Cadbury doesn't do that well here, and Hershey doesn't necessarily do that well in the UK, and here we are, we all look alike, but somehow we eat different candy bars. And we, it's 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 uh, it's very interesting to observe, and the idea that you have some formula for businesses that provide that each one should pursue uh, the course they're on because they made it in X, they should try to find other ways to make it in X. We're quite willing to find it in A, B, C, D, E, or F, which is like the money is fungible. I think actually it's worked very much to our advantage to have that philosophy. So, anything further, Charlie? I once told a very great man at dinner after he'd written a very great book, I said, you know, you're never going to write another great book like that. And he was deeply offended. And I've read his four subsequent bits and I, books and I'm totally right. <laughs> to write one great book is a lot to do in one lifetime. And the people aren't holding back on you when they don't do more. It's hard. But you ought to make the most of the one first one you got. Yeah, you're, you're lucky. You know. And, uh, yes. And we were, we were very fortunate. Yeah. I would have blown the chance to buy C's candy, uh, but Charlie, uh, Charlie said, "Don't be so cheap, basically." And and we still, we still got it at a pretty good price. <laughs> and, and we it's amazing how we much learned. we learned over the years. Yeah. And learned. if we hadn't, the record would be so much worse. Yeah. Yeah. At any given time, what we already knew was not going to be enough to take us to the next step. That's what makes it difficult. Think of all the people you know that have tried to take one extra step and have fallen off a cliff. Well, on that happy note, we will conclude the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, but save, save some of it for next year. We may need it then. So that, yeah, just, just give us a carry forward on the rest of it. And thank you. We'll come back at 3.45. We will conduct the business of the meeting. And uh, it, it doesn't, we have no, uh, uh, nothing on the proxy to vote on, but we will be back here in 15 minutes. And uh, if you enjoy a process, you can stick around and watch us reelect our board. Thank you. Thanks for coming.